Hello and welcome to our Teachers Talk History online session this morning. We are so excited to have so many of you having signed up on our StreamYard link, which you can click on again today. If you are watching live, if you click on that link, you will be able to keep in touch with us via all our different socials and hear about all of our events coming up later on in this year. We can't believe that quite so many of you are joining us on a Saturday morning and I think this is testament to the absolute geekery and commitment of history teachers um, across the world essentially. You can always let us know where you are tuning in from today. Um, we are really excited to bring you our first event of the year. As I said, we have other ones planned later on in the year. Um, and remember to sign up to that link so you can hear about those later on. We are using the hashtag, hashtag TT History Today. So please do trend. Um, please do share on your socials. We quite often get trend, we are quite often end up trending with our history teacher to um, teach meets. So let's see if we can do that today. Um, I also want to say thank you to Time Travel Education, who are sponsoring today's event. They specialise in bringing history to life through trips, both domestic and international, in school workshops and VR experiences. You can find out more by visiting them at timetraveleducation.co.uk or by clicking the QR code on screen now. They, if you've ever been to any of our events before, particularly our face-to-face -face ones, you'll know how the work that they do and how amazing it is. So please do go and find out more about them. Um, so we have got a range of voices for you today. Um, some people have never spoken before, some people you might recognise. We have got teachers right at the beginning of their career, teachers really far into their career. We have got teachers speaking to you from abroad and we even have some teachers that are north of the border in Scotland today. So one of the things we love about here at Teachers Talk History is bringing you something new and different and bringing you the range of different voices. So we are super excited for that today. Our first talk today is going to be from Kerry Summers. She is a primary teacher and specialist education lead in Hampshire. Um, she's also on the HA primary committee and is a lead teacher of history as well. Her focus today is an awesome inquiry on both Anglo-Saxon and Viking Britain. This was something that I spotted on Twitter and thought we absolutely have to have Kerry to speak to us today. And although she is primary, she there is a lot in there for her to bring to secondary colleagues as well. So we are going to be looking at the Anglo-Saxon and Viking struggle for Great Britain, a year five inquiry. Thank you very much, Kerry. Hi, good morning. I have to apologise because I've got a bit of a cold. So I'm um, sorry to all of you from here. My lovely nasal voice. I'm just going to present. OK, so I've come to talk to you today, give you a bit of a whistle stop tour on a, a unit that I really enjoy teaching about the Anglo-Saxon and Viking struggle for England um, with our year five children. Um, and I just thought I'd start by showing you, this is a copy of our medium term plan, because I always start before I don't even think about um, starting teaching. I start to think about what is that substantive knowledge that I'm going to be developing? What is that disciplinary knowledge the children are going to develop? And um, even though they're they're entwined, and I like this, there's a um, quote by Jonathan Lear in his book, M Monkey Box, something like that, where he says, when I say I can ride a bike, I'm not just saying that I know the theory of riding a bike, I also have the skills to, to ride it. So I like that idea of the fact that the substantive and their disciplinary knowledge are really entwined throughout. And that's certainly the case with this inquiry. Um, but I've, I've used this medium term plan to really think about which of those things, how that knowledge is going to be developing across the course of the unit. So I'll just move on. And the skills that we were focusing on throughout the unit were historical interpretation and change in continuity. And although lots of we were developing lots of knowledge, we were looking at chronology and um, cause and consequence and other skills and knowledge as well. Um, these were our two key ones for the disciplinary knowledge there, the historical interpretation, looking at why different counts, accounts of the past emerge and understand why some of those interpretations might be more useful than others to us. Um, and change in continuity, thinking about why change happened and the impact of that change. 
So this is just a bit of context. We sort of started our topic by thinking about how we left Britain when, when we carried out our last history unit. So the children in year four learn about the Anglo-Saxons at our school. So it was just drawing on what they remembered. So before we started thinking about the Vikings coming to England, we thought about um, where, where we had last left Britain. And this book, The Conquerors, was recommended to me by Elsa Fiddler. And... Um, it's it's if you haven't read it i suggest you do it's brilliant it's by david mckee who wrote the alma books i believe but it it's in a really simple way talks about um a group of people who were going and invading other countries and whether they actually considering whether they ever conquered those countries and that um as a sort of introduction got the children really talking about all the previous units they'd looked at before, the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, and thought about, well, did has Britain been con conquered before? Has England been conquered? And what does that mean? And some of our substantive concepts for the unit that we were developing were invasion settlement. So it started us talking about, well, what does that mean? And why does this happen? Um, and um, what we were worried about was some of the children finding it hard to connect with with the story of the Vikings coming. It's such a long time ago, and um, a, a little bit um, we we wanted to we really wanted to help them connect with the history. And so we thought, well, let's get them really involved in it personally and get that emotional response as well. So on the left there, you can see one of our lanyards. Every child was given a lanyard when they entered the classroom for the very first day we were teaching this. And they were either an Anglo-Saxon or they were a Viking and they could see what their name was. As you can see, I, I won't, oh, gone too far forward. Um, I won't try and pronounce it because I pronounced it wrong. The meaning behind, underneath was was what it meant in um, what that what that name meant. And the children really proudly wore their lanyards to show whether they were an Anglo-Saxon or a Viking. On our working wall, you can see on the right there, um, the, the replica name was stuck either on the... Um, picture of the United Kingdom or it was on the flags to show where they were currently so the children knew who they were and where they lived and then as we worked through the unit the children could see that their names were moving on the board to show where they were coming so they really they really liked that it really helps them connect with the narrative and they were so excited about it that before we finished the unit um, they had made their own lanyards for every teacher in the school which was great because then as the children were, were out on the playground the teachers could talk to them about oh how are we doing at the moment in their battle for England well how are the Vic I'm a Viking how are the Vikings doing or how are the Anglo-Saxons doing and it really got everyone in the school the whole the whole sort of school community was really engaged in what in what was happening with the children's history and the children were really keen and excited to talk about it. I thought I'd show you um, this on our working wall just because we've been thinking at our school about how to really develop the children's knowledge of these substantive concepts so sometimes referred to as golden threads we looked at our curriculum and thought about which of those concepts appear again and again in our learning and this is one of the ways in which we help the children sort of build on their knowledge so I've done a close-up of invasion there for you to see when we started this unit the children started talking about well what do we know about this concept and you can you should be able to see it's quite small but at first, they're thinking about the Romans. They knew that Romans had a strong army and that they, they stood and fought certain formations and that they invaded Britain and they wanted land. And so they started with what they knew. And as the unit developed, you can see more and more post-it notes have been added each week um, to show their developing knowledge of invasion. And at the end of the unit, I take a picture of these concepts and they get passed up to the next class. So in their next units, when they come across these ideas again, the children can reflect on, on what they know. So we started the unit um, in a really exciting way. We said, right, it's the year 789. We're living in Anglo-Saxon Britain and we're farming. And this young boy runs up and tells us he has seen something coming across Southampton water. We don't know whether they're friendly. We don't know if they're if they're nice or whether they've come to invade. So we need to we need to find out who these people are. But you need to be really careful because we don't want them to see you um, just in case they're dangerous. So we'd set up in our school um, just um, outside 
outside the classroom, really, um, some pictures of a Viking longboat. And the children in their groups of four had to, they were all numbered one to four. And when it was their turn, so if we shouted out number ones, they ran down to Southampton Water, let's say, saw the picture of what was coming. And then they had to, at the call of me saying, quick, they're looking this way, you need to come back. They ran back to the classroom and started drawing what they could see. And um, then the number twos went and so on. And one, it was really, the children were really excited to draw what they were seeing. But rather than just show them the source straight away, it got them to really think about the detail that they could see in there. And it got them really discussing it. Had I just shown them the picture, I don't think we would have got the rich discussion that we did this way. They were talking about what they could see. I was able to get them to think a bit deeply, more deeply by saying things like, oh, wow, there's only three of these people on the ship. So perhaps it's going to be all right. Or they're all smiling. So perhaps they're friendly. And to which the children were like, oh, no, I'm going to check that next time. And ran back and um, chat when it was their turn and added and cha- made those changes to their pictures. Um, what was also really interesting in this is identifying current stereotypes that the children had um, and those misconceptions. Some of the children that did recognise these people as Vikings and obviously had some prior knowledge of that had drawn, and I think you can see it in that bottom left picture, had drawn the two horns. There was absolutely no pictures of anyone with two horns on the picture that I gave them, but it just shows that that was a current misconception that they were they were applying to their work. So once they'd done this, we kind of brought the learning together and thought about, there's the picture there in the middle, and thought about what what did you see and what could you work out? What questions would you raise about these people? And you can see that they've sort of started sharing their ideas. Then we thought about, well, if we're going to find out about the Vikings, where do they fit on our timelines? This is an example of the timeline we use. Um, in our school, and I think hopefully in most schools, we, we teach this really explicitly in the same way that if we were teaching a line graph, we'd have to go through how it worked and um, what how how all that explicitly teach it. It's the same with the timeline. So we look at the increments of time. We talk about duration and overlap um, and look at where different periods that we've studied fit together to give them that that chronological narrative Um, and the children were surprised to see that um, when they had their Viking slip of paper because all the ones the people that they'd the periods they'd already studied were on there and they just had to think well where do I put the um, Vikings and they realized that it then overlapped with where the Saxons were so the children then added that to their um, timelines which you can see a copy of here then um, we thought about uh, how the Vikings were portrayed and we wondered whether it would be a fair portrayal. I'm going to skip fairly quickly so we don't run out of time. Um, but here is, um, it was a podcast the children heard. It's not a real one. It's one I made up and my husband recorded for me. But um, the children were listening to it and, and could obviously pick out that, oh, it says about the Vikings being bloodthirsty and villains and their horns and how scary they are. And then we, our inquiry was about, well, do they deserve this reputation? Is this an accurate depiction of the Vikings? So we started looking at, um, we always, through any history unit we do at our school, we think about real historians and what they say. Um, and we were looking at did, what different historians were saying about the Vikings and why they came to England. And so these two historians here, Lucy Worsley, David Olisoga, we looked at what they've said and we kind of debated um, the, the, these quotations throughout the unit. So when we looked at a source, we thought, well, do you think this one that was you know, written at the time or um, is that as accurate as something we're looking at now? And is it as useful for our inquiry? So it just stimulated um, lots of discussion. Like most schools, we've kind of moved away from the reliability because we think that can give the children lots of misconceptions. We don't talk about reliability because every source is a reliable picture of what someone thought or what someone said. Um, so, but it but it did raise some interesting discussions.
So we looked at how Vikings were portrayed in the media and different different places. So there's some pictures of books and the children were picking out that, my goodness, don't they look aggressive and they're ready for war. Um, they're attacking people. They're untrustworthy. They're powerful. And we also, not just looking at pictures of the Vikings and, and books and places that they're shown, but also ways in which the word Viking has been used to advertise as well. That, like you can see at the bottom there for Viking removals and it made the children realize that they're still portrayed as being powerful strong efficient they get the job done um so the, the children already kind of had an idea of how we see vikings um so we used a bit of storytelling i talked about the attack on lindisfarne and told it as a story to the children who they loved it because there's so many horrible little bits of facts and things that you can throw in that the children like a bit of blood and gore and violence so um, they enjoyed the story but then they had to retell the story now our little Viking children with their Viking names they got together and thought about uh, creating a story map telling the story from their point of view so they were talking about how brave we were sailing across the ocean to get to this new land and and um, whereas uh, Anglo-Saxon children talked about um, the Viking attack on Lindisfarne from, from their point of view, how they might have perceived it. So um, you can see there, they've created these stories maps as they talked it through, and they were really confident at retelling the story. What was nice then is we paired up the Viking children with an Anglo-Saxon child, and they both told the story from their point of view. So the children were starting to think about how um, the same event, the same thing that happened, um, might look different from different perspectives. We also looked at different sources um, and the children thought about um, whose perspective it was from. We, this was helping us develop our idea of inter interpretation, um, thinking about who wrote the source and why. Um, and this final source, the child's picked out that actually that is almost 100 years after the attack. They knew about Alfred the Great from their Anglo-Saxon inquiry. They were saying, well, this is funny because maybe they became settlers because now we've got Alfred talking about, um, talking positively about a Viking. So they started to realise that perception changes. This again is um, an example of when they were creating sources, but they were looking at... Um, whether their source was told from a Viking perspective or from an Anglo-Saxon perspective and how that might look different. Um, we, I love a living graph and I'm sure lots of you have tried living graphs in your classroom. We did this more as a, as a story, as a narrative. So although it looks like lots of writing, this was a whole afternoon of acting. So the children were came into the classroom and it was set out into different Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And as we went through the story, this each line here, you can see just one line, like Viking ships from Norway attacked for the first time. But actually, we were really telling it like a story. The children were acting it out. And then at, at the end, we sort of looked at these graphs and thought, out, well, how does that show how successful the Vikings were at this point? Um, so this took a lot of discussion, a lot of role play. And you can see there, that the children have got a really clear idea they could they could use their work then to talk about when they thought the Vikings were most and least successful. So it was really helpful, a really powerful tool. Um, next time, if I'm honest with you, I'd probably do less because I think we had so many events in there. It took a long time to act it out, but it was a really fun day. And we had lots of teachers at the end of the day come and say, what on earth was going on in your class? Because the children got so excited if they, if the Viking children thought it was great, if they were being really successful. And the Anglo-Saxon children really felt like they'd got their own back when something was going well for them. Um... We also looked at, this is a task taken from Key Stage History, but it was um, lots of different statements about the Vikings to dispel some of the myths that the children might have about them. And they used the sources that were stuck in the picture gallery around the room to work out how they could prove that these things were correct. And created captions um, for a museum to show how actually Vikings might be shown in a positive, in a more positive light. 
when we were looking at change and continuity, um, you can see there the children have drawn on their on their tables, whether it was a big change or a small change, and how much considering how much impact each change had. So they were given all these cards about different changes that happened in Viking times. And it created so much discussion about whether it was a, a big change, small change, positive impact, negative impact. But after that discussion, all the children were really clearly able to talk about, and you can see some of the extracts of their writing here, um, they were really clearly able to pick out where they thought the biggest changes occurred and how much impact it had um, using their graphs and the discussions that they had had. And some of our children at the end, well, all of our children, actually, we, we were looking in English, we were looking at podcasts in different ways that... Um, podcasts are used to share information and the children all created their own which were then sent to we really believe in authentic outcomes so their podcasts were sent to Greg Jenner of Horrible Histories who did write us an email back to say how brilliant he thought they were which the children thought was fantastic um, but we'd we'd looked at different podcasts and there was some autonomy there some of the children chose to do it like a um, interview um, with an expert historian. One of them was enrolled as an expert historian and one was asking questions. Some did it like a story, um, story time of what happened, and some did it a bit horrible history style. I'm not sure whether this will play, but I can try. I don't know if I don't know whether you could hear that or not, um, but hopefully be able to access it afterwards if I send a link to to Teachers Talk Radio because it's brilliant to listen to and the children got so excited about sharing their learning. Um, we finished the unit last year by creating um, a new badge for the English heritage. So the children were posed with the problem that the English heritage liked to give badges out to children that visit over the holidays, showing different periods of time. And we looked at some of their, the ones that already exist. And then I showed them a pretend one that had been designed for the Vikings, um, which showed them as violent and bloodthirsty. And the children created their own fairer badges um, to show what they were really like and wrote a letter to the English Heritage to say why they had designed those badges. This year we're going to be trying something different as you can see from the screen there. I'm a massive Lego fan, um, love building Lego, I think it might be my midlife crisis and um, I was having a look in the Lego shop and saw these sets of the Vikings. Now you will point out straight away that this Viking here has two horns. I noticed that the vast majority of characters that I saw were men. They had the long ship and they had this interesting looking uh, Viking village. And I just thought, actually, our children will really enjoy arguing that. This is a, a little go I've had at writing a letter of the sort of thing that I'm hoping to produce with the children or work on with the children. But they're going to design their own set and then advise Lego um, as to what they should include. So perhaps it should show evidence of the fact that they actually traded. Perhaps it should show um, evidence of the different places they travelled, um, or the Abbasid Caliphate, for example. So I want to, that they're going to design their own set that will will share a more um, positive um, idea of the Vikings, but also a more rounded view, um, and and a, a show them um, not just as warriors that came on their long boats, but also show show about the other things they did, and show them as settlers, show them as um, traders, and um, just teach others about the Vikings through their Lego set. So that's what we're hoping to do this time. I'm just going to finish by showing you one of our assessment sheets. This is not perfect by any means, but it's always useful to see, or I always find it useful to see what other teachers are doing. So in the interests of sharing, um, this is how we kind of had at the end as a an assessment, not the only assessment. I don't believe that children should be judged by um, one assessment or how well they write on the day that I get choose to give them this. We're actually making observations and thinking about how how we can support the children and their learning throughout the unit. Um, the podcasts means that they can share their learning through talk and discussion, um, as do the graphs that they've created, their role play, um, as will the um, des design of a new Lego set be inclusive for all children. However, I did want to have a go at, at doing a slightly more formal um, 
assessment as well to kind of gauge what the children have developed in their knowledge for some of those substantive and disciplinary concepts that we've been looking at. Um, and you can see they're given a definition for the word invasion and which of these definitions best describes the idea of society, for instance. So um, I've got about a minute, Kerry. That's probably, sorry. Yeah, I, well, I think I'll just finish there, really. So that's just a whistle stop tour. Really happy to be contacted if anyone wants to know any more. But thank you um, and, um, for giving me this opportunity to share. Thank you. I think we can all agree that there was so much to take away from that. Like many of you here today, I'm secondary school history and I was blown away by what Kerry is expecting from her key stage two historians. And so I think there's lessons for us all there in terms of what we are expecting those historians to do when they enter us in year seven. Love the absolute focus on interpretations and using historians and all of those ideas. And I noticed that Sally said she'd never seen a living graph before. Well, now you have and now you can go away and use them with your own. There's some great ones for um, using, as I think, particularly with edX, uh, with um, the GCSE Germany course, they're a really good way to use living graphs as well. And the authentic outcomes is fantastic. How amazing, Kerry, for your um, kids to get an email back from Greg Jenner there. So that is absolutely amazing. And thank you so much. You will be able to find all of our presentations on our TES shop afterwards, um, and you will get a recording of this as well. If you can keep sharing on socials, if you have got any um, questions for any of our speakers today, please pop those on our, on our socials as well and we can um, ask those questions after the things. You can also find an updated running order on the socials as well. Next up, uh, we have got Matt Bancroft. Now, Matt is a first year ECT, so a big warm welcome to Matt in the history teaching community here. He teaches at a boys' grammar school in Cheshire. He is really interested in classroom pedagogy and creating rigorous historical inquiry, which has led to him delivering CPD sessions at his current school and also doing something with the University of Manchester later in the year. Um, he's really excited to share some of those activities that he's worked on this year, and, um, and he hopes that you will find them really useful. So welcome, Matt, and thank you very much for joining us today, and I will hand over to you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Emily, and thank you very much for having me as well. Um, I'm a first year ECT, so it's so uh, lovely to be sharing the stage with some amazing teachers today. Um, in some ways, I'm going to be following on from Kerry's inquiry there and sort of making our history lessons more relevant to um, the students that we're teaching. Uh, I really love some of those ideas um, in Kerry's talk, I was sat there writing them down. So definitely things to try on that end. Um, for me today, my talk is sort of in, inspired by a, a post I saw over the Christmas holidays on, um, on Facebook. And I thought this surely can't be right. And as we're all historians, um, as we're all historians, we are probably gonna analyze the source. Um, and I'm not so much talking about um, Darren Day in the bottom in a <clears throat> crazed sort of look. I'm thinking more about the top picture. And we can all see there that there's a textbook. And that led me to two questions. Is the uh, textbook about pedagogy, how we're teaching history, or is the textbook about the actual content? So I coach a girls football team and I thought they were a good place to start. So the first thing that I did was uh, ask the parents um, what they thought about history. Uh, so as we can see there, Olivia's dad hated the teacher. Uh, Charlotte's mum wasn't very good at retaining information. Um, Liv's mum loved hearing the stories, but hated being tested. And uh, Eleanor's mum found that she was often just dictated to. Um, so what we can see there is that the issue with history let's say about 20 years ago, was uh, actual classroom pedagogy. Now, interestingly, um, my under 11 footballers had a different point of view. Um, MK says, we only ever learn about boring stuff. Maya doesn't like learning about war stuff. Charlotte says it's boring and doesn't like the Peterloo massacre, which we are working on changing. Um, and uh, it's already happened and I'm not interested in how the Romans ate or paid for things, says Liv. So what's interesting here is that we've seen a sort of change from the issue with history being the actual classroom pedagogy to the substantive content. You can see that 
MK thinks it's boring. The, it stuff's boring. Maya doesn't like the war stuff. Charlotte doesn't like the Peterloo massacre. Um, Liv thinks it's already happened. She doesn't like the Romans. And that got me thinking why we have such a wealth of interesting substantive content to deliver. So why is it that the children who we are teaching it to aren't finding it interesting? So I thought that I would try and pitch my history to the context of my school. So um, I work at an all boys school and Google tells me that uh, a teenage boy should like the following things, trainers, jeans, a jacket, mobile phone, iPod, wallet, DS, that kind of thing. Um, but as we are historians and we do analyze sources, uh, this one is probably um, a little bit dated. I can see an iPod I had when I was much younger and a DS I had when I was about four years old. So clearly we need to get a more updated view. So I just asked some of the boys in one of my classes. Um, and these are the sort of things that came back. They're obviously big football fans. I'm glad that United is the biggest one. Sorry to any uh, City fans or other ones in the room. Um, also, um, there are uh, things like TikTok, uh, Fortnite, FIFA, um, Snapchat, football, all those kind of things. And if I had to break these down into sort of four categories, I've gone for music, gaming, social media and football. So what I have then tried to do subsequently is use these four elements in my task design. Um, so I'm just going to talk you through now a few of the tasks that I've used where I've tried to incorporate these as a theme. Um, and um, hopefully you find these useful. So the first thing that I've done is use social media. So I'm going to talk through a few examples of using social media um, as a uh, a, 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 as an activity. So the first thing that I've used it for is a research task. Now, it must be said that when I am designing these, I'm not just designing them to be fun. Um, I think what's really important is that there is some historical rigor um, staying in um, across of the activities, but then also um, there is maybe perhaps an exam element or um, a, a sort of disciplinary focus there. So. This first one I wanted to do is flip learning. Uh, I wanted them to just come to lesson prepared for the background knowledge about Elizabeth. So this is for my year 10 GCSE class who were doing the AQA Elizabethan England. Um, and basically the four things I wanted them to take away was who Elizabeth's family were, that she had an education, um, what religion she was and the significant dates in her early life. Now, I could have just asked that those four questions. But what I decided to do instead was to create this sort of Facebook profile. And each section is sort of using um, a different disciplinary skill, if you like. So the first one, they are just getting those key details in. So that about section, that connection section, they are just getting the key details in. The bit where there's an actual sort of timeline of posts, again, the chronology is sort of done for them but they're assessing the significance of those certain dates. So why is that date important? Because what they're having to think about is they weren't just writing um, Elizabeth is removed from the line of succession. They had to put that in uh, terms of what Elizabeth would think about it. So why would that be a significant event to Elizabeth? Because they had to post it like they were Elizabeth. And then finally, when we got to the bio, it was all about synthesizing that early um information about Elizabeth's early life into a bio. So really getting them to think about what the key information they've got is and summarizing it. Um, now, I haven't just used Facebook. There are a few other examples we're going to have a look, but this was just one that I really enjoyed with um, the year 10s again earlier in the year on the uh, Weimar Nazi Germany course. Um, what I wanted them to assess was the change in continuity between um, life for women in Weimar Germany and life for women in Nazi Germany. And I probably would have, my go-to would have been to do that in a table, just to compare them side by side. But what I did instead uh, was again use the Facebook profile, but changed it up a little bit. So um, they had to sort of get the key points about, okay, what's happened in terms of their relationship, in terms of their education, employment, fashion, and hobbies, because I wanted them to sort of assess these areas here of marriage and children, appearance, and employment. Um, 
but then get to think a bit more. So getting them to actually draw that profile picture in. Um, again, that bio idea. And then upcoming events. What type of things would this person do in Weimar Germany compared to Nazi Germany in the future? Um, so on to a different one. Um, this was one that, again, I was using in the Elizabeth course. Um, it was all about using social media to like sort of um, build up to an explain question. Um, so this one, I was sort of sat at my computer like half five um, in the evening doing a bit of lesson planning. And I was thinking, how can I make control interesting? Control, control, control. And as we all probably do, uh, flicked onto my phone and I thought, well, the control center. Um, so what I did was, what I did was put together um, a an iPhone control center. And what it allowed me to do was incorporate an element of dual coding. So I changed the control center from not having um, the sort of Apple um, symbols on it to having symbols that would relate to how Elizabeth kept control over parliament. Um, so what they had to do is pick the, a button out and then match it to um, what method Elizabeth used to keep control. And I found that the boys really engaged with it because, um, because simply because it was an iPhone. Um, and what was really funny is the few of them that were observing did realize that I picked Under Pressure by Queen as the song to be playing because Elizabeth was under pressure in the early years of her reign. So that was pretty funny uh, on that, on that, in that sense. And then the last one I've sort of, for the social media, before we move on to a couple of the other ones, um, I've used social media for um, interpretations. So this would be for the year 11s doing the Power and the People course and looking at the miners' strike and Thatcher's uh, dealing with the, the miners' unions. Now, um, what I wanted them to do is think about, well, who won, who who is it a win for? Who won overall? So we've done that before with the trade union movement in terms of um, a living graph, but I wanted to change it a little bit different, uh, more to make it a little bit different this time. So what I've done is instead of getting them to just go, um, the use of flying pickets was a win for the uh, Arthur Scargill. I wanted them to put two um, Twitter profiles side by side and tweet as if they were Arthur Scargill or Margaret Thatcher. What would they have thought of the decision to close the mines? Who is that a win for? Is it a win for Thatcher because she's finally got her um, ideology passed? How annoyed is Arthur Scargill? Um, and just getting them to think then about what they would have, how those individuals would have interpreted the events at the time. Um, now, um, moving on to like sort of games and that kind of thing, um, we've done, we've used Crossy Road for uh, analysis chains. And I'm sure that we've all used Peel at some point. Um, it is obviously still useful uh, in terms of a, a scaffold, but I find that actually sometimes what my boys don't know as much is the how the, how they explain things. So uh, I'm not sure if this is actually going to work, but the chicken does move. Um, so what they had to no, it doesn't move. But um, what they had to do is get the chicken from one side of the road to the other. Um, and they so this was again for the year 11s, looking at the pilgrimage of grace. Why? What was the fa a factor that caused it, and why? So um, they obviously they start a religion and then they have to pick which one was caused by religion. Is it the pilgrimage of grace or American Revolution? Why? Because has, has Henry VIII turned the country from Protestant to Catholic, Catholic to Protestant, Protestant to Puritan? And then what is the issue then? So people want it in the North wanted it back, people in the South wanted it back, or people in East Anglia wanted it back. So um, at each stop, um, the floors then opened up to the, to, the, to the students. So I would be probing them with a bit more um, formative assessment, getting the students to build on each other's explanations. And then eventually by the end, I'll be writing it down on the board as we go. And eventually we've created um, a, a, a appeal paragraph. Um, we're just in a little bit of a different, perhaps more engaging way. And I found that the boys really do like that. Um, other examples we use of games for um, feedback that we haven't done here. We've done feedback football, 
Um, they are obsessed with that. Um, split them into two teams. And then everybody that can produce me a peel paragraph, their team gets a point. Um, and um, using games like that, I found has been really um, beneficial in terms of their engagement, but also in terms of the amount of um, formative assessment I get off the students as well. Um, this was one of my favorite activities I've done so far. Again, this is with the year 11s, actually, but this is um, the context for the 19th century. And they're going on to the sort of the Victorians and the changes there. Um, this was an idea for them to get the background of the Victorians. Um, and I was thinking about what I could do. And I was thinking about what I could do for a while. And then I realized that one of my favorite bands who I'm still yet to see live is the Lathams and uh, they have a song on it. And I remember actually at the time when I heard it for the first time thinking, actually, it's not bad. It's quite historically accurate. So um, we put the lyrics on the board um, and we actually, we just picked them apart and I sort of talked them through. Well, what do you think that could mean? What do you think this could mean? And actually by the time they dissected the lyrics, they had a pretty good picture uh, of the Victorian period to sort of act as a base to start from. However, I also wanted them to have the ideas because we are looking at protest over time about um, how attitudes to social welfare and things had changed, which aren't necessarily there in the lyrics. So the next activity was they had to create their own um, third verse. Now, you're probably thinking classroom full of boys, 16 year old boys, um, they are not gonna get up and perform. They are not gonna write a verse to a song. However, again, because I sort of know my class quite well, out of the boys in that room, that six of them are music students. And I think of those six, I think three of them are singers. So we actually had some really, really good performances and some really good verses about um, Samuel Smiles and his attitude of self-help and how that's sort of changing and that kind of thing. So um, it was really, really good to see. And we actually tweeted the Lathams and did get a reply back, which was wonderful. Um, and they really enjoyed that sort of engagement as well. Um, the last thing I'm going to look at um, before I finish, just so we don't run out of time, is um, how we've used football. Um, and I think the main way I've done this, or the, the way it's been this, the most successful, is by using football to explain interpretations. Because what I find is if you, what I, well, what I found actually is if you put an article about football in front of them, they can pick the key message out. They know in that first interpretation that the PSG president is pretty happy with Ronaldo. He, he, he is saying he's a fantastic athlete. In the second interpretation, they can pick out that Wayne Rooney is saying that Ronaldo is vain. As soon as you change that content to something historical, that all seems to go out the window. So what we decided to do is write an interpretation question for, um, for these two articles. So um, this was more for the um, Weimar Nazi Germany course, where they have a how do the interpretations differ looking at their content and then why do they differ looking at the provenance? Um, so we looked at the key messages in these two and then I gave them a bit of context. So why? Why would they think this? And lots of them picked out that, oh, actually, um, you know, the PSG president, because Ronaldo wants to leave Juventus, probably wants to sign him. And then similarly, um, the boys picked out that, oh, well, Rooney's been critical of Ronaldo but that's because he's just left. He's probably not happy about that. And I was like, okay, so you just do that exact same process with, um, with historical sources as well. Um, and actually the interpretation uh, responses that we've had back have been uh, uh, lots, lots better since because I find that, that picking out the key message is the hardest thing for them and just putting it in a relatable format um, has been really beneficial for them. So that's sort of everything from me. It's a whistle stop tour of some of the activities that I've been doing. Um, my, those girls that gave us such uh, wonderful quotes about history are playing in about half an hour. So I will have to quickly depart. Um, but I just want to say thank you very much for having me on today. Um, if you do want to follow up with any questions or anything like that, my Twitter is at Mr. Bancroft Hist. Um, and good luck to the rest of the amazing speakers today and have a fantastic day, everybody.
Thank you very much, Matt. There are some great ideas there. I particularly love the idea of like songs as sources. Um, it's not something that I've come across before. And I think that that could be really, uh, really helpful in some of the classrooms. I must admit, I am not down with the kids. I often have to ask my uh, year tens to translate things for me. Um, so using this to really engage them. And I think it's a really great example as well of how you make things work for your context. You know, you've got those tricky boys. They're not that interested. And this is something that means that they have, they've brought them in. And I know Carmel said as as well you know it's a great to use starting points that they're aware of so I think there's things that we can all take away from that as well so thank you very much Matt for today and good luck with your uh, football game <laughs> thank you very much thank you see you later bye um, so next up, we have got Emily fuller show who is going to come and talk to us about effective task design. Now, what is great about today is we are looking at this from slightly different um, perspectives. So later on, we have got Carl McGrath talking about task design in primary history, whereas Emily just now is going to talk to us about effective task design using Fiorella and Mayer's generative learning in action. And hopefully I have sense said that right. So um, let's move on to Emily. Good morning. You just need to unmute, Emily. Back to COVID days. <laughs> do you want exactly. me to share my um, PowerPoint or do you have it? There. If you can share it for us. So Emily is an author of some amazing books, which you can go off and find um, find elsewhere. She's a teacher, an edu blogger and a Teach Talk radio presenter. She is on secondment at the minute, gaining experience in the Middle East. So thank you so much for uh, tuning in this morning. She has served as head of history. She's excelled as a lead practitioner, a specialist lead of education and a governor. Um, she's been nominated for the King's College University History Teachers Network as a result of her outstanding things at A-level. So hopefully we are going to find out loads of things today, Emily, and all about how um, you have managed that wonderful repertoire of history related things. Um, thank you. Just trying to find where I put the PowerPoint. Um, give me one second. Oh, um, it says choose a smaller file. The size limit is 50. Right. I don't know if I can. Just bear with us, folks. It's always tricky trying to get these there. It's Emily, early. you'll just need to, you'll need to just share your screen. You'll just have to share your full screen. So where okay. it says present, if you just click um, share screen. Okay, give me one second. Thank you. This um, bodes well. Emily's got uh, so Just much a reminder, to everyone, uh, while we're waiting, um, it's fantastic to see so many people here. You know, this, um, we've had, I think, 350 concurrent um, watches and viewers so far. So that's absolutely amazing. A uh, huge shout out to the, the TT History team, uh, Emily, Claire, and Tina. Um, amazing job. I'll obviously say that at the end anyway. Um, but um, yeah, we've got so much more to, to go today. So yeah, really looking forward to the rest of the talk. So I'll pass back to Emily. Maybe now Emily would, would be a good time oh, to talk nice. about time travel really briefly. Yes. In fact, I'll put the yeah. QR code up. Brilliant. So just a reminder then that we are sponsored today by um, Time Travel Education. They have very kindly sponsored today's event and many of our events in the past as well. They specialise in bringing history to life through trips, both domestic and international. Their in-school VR experience is amazing. Um, I've tried it on and <laughs> that can be absolutely fantastic and they've also got workshops as well you can find out more by visiting them at timetraveleducation.co.uk or by clicking on the qr code on screen now so go and check them out and they're doing a great job of um, sponsoring us today and in everything that they do just a reminder to keep sharing on socials as well, please. We have got some great comments, some great takeaways so far from today. Um, and we have got loads, as Tom said, coming up later on in today. So as well as task design in primary history, We've also got our amazing um, interview, exclusive interview um, between Christine Council and Tom, which will be coming up after Emily's design. It looks like she is ready now. So if you are, Emily, I will hand over to you. Thank you. So you can see my screen just to double check because I can't see nothing can. apart from it. Yeah, your camera's, your camera's off though, Emily. I don't know whether you want to put your camera back on. Um, uh, no, I... no, no, not there. I mean on StreamYard. So you've turned, uh, your, you've turned your camera off. Um, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, so you can see everything yeah. now. Fantastic. We can't so <laughs> and if you just want to click hide as well on there, and okay. there's a little icon there, you just click hide. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So um, good morning, everyone. Sorry about the technical glitches. And welcome to my session on effective task design by um, Fiorella and Mayor's Generative Learning in Action within the History Classroom. It's a pleasure to have you all here today as we delve into the exciting realm of crafting tasks that truly engage historical cognitive processes. So why this topic and why now? So I've been contemplating effective task design and history for quite some time now, especially within the context of teaching in an international setting where engagement and performance often takes priority over deep learning. This line of thinking was further reinforced when I stumbled upon a series of thought provoking tweets recently. Um, reflecting on my own practices, especially my early years, I must admit to prioritising engagement over genuine learning by incorporating activities like creating reality TV scenarios or crafting social media posts. However, the shift towards research informed methods in the UK since around 2016-17 has led me to reconsider the prevalence of these flashy or shiny activities within our classrooms. Now, I'm not suggesting that our lessons should be dull and uninspiring. Rather, it's about challenging the notion of what truly constitutes meaningful historical engagement. Additionally, I believe it's important for us to sharpen our professional discernment in an age where we have ample amount of ideas shared on um, social media. Um, there's a subtle pressure to constantly pursue the next big trend. We must resist this urge and instead focus on what generally serves um, our students' historical learning needs. Therefore, we need to have a sharpened discernment to avoid the next shiny thing syndrome that can sometimes eclipse the conceptual knowledge and historical understanding we aim to build within our students. As a result, today's session will center upon um, main activity um, main activity ideas without looking at checks or understanding ideas or starter activities and so on. So as a result, sorry to say guys, there's nothing new here. Um, nothing innovative, nothing fancy. In fact, today's session will bring back to remembrance the old traditional um, activities that worked, that were effective in building conceptual understanding. The purpose of this session is to illustrate why what you likely already do, if prioritizing learning over performance, of course, is highly effective. Today's session is more to raise a klaxon to remain integral to the disciplines of history through our task design. We often, as I mentioned, feel pressure to constantly introduce new activities and we shouldn't abandon effective methods, for example, the Diamond Nine, just because it's familiar. It's crucial to consider students' perspectives what may seem repetitive to us can still engage them, especially as they study a variety of subjects with different teachers. Instead of constantly seeking new activities, we should focus on mastering a smaller set periodically, and periodically, I should say, introduce fresh new ones. This approach maintains variety without overwhelming us. While some variety is important, it's equally crucial to provide a mixed economy of activities across lessons to cater to all students' needs. Essentially, we should continually ask ourselves, how can we do what we already do better? The quote by John Piper that you see on the screen seems to be quite cynical, but sometimes the repackaging can make the package item, i.e. activity, more effective. So I have some key words. So when designing effective and appropriate activities, we need to understand some key words, for example, learning. The common um, definition for learning is an alteration in long-term memory. Schema, webs of knowledge or connected knowledge. And a new word, mathemagnik, I can't pronounce it, which gives birth to learning, which was coined by Ernst Rothkopf in 1970. So quick progress check in the um, chat. Can you just finish off the sentences? So learning is, is it A, B, C? Schema is um, A, B, or C, and Mathignic is A, B, or C. I'll just give you about one minute to jot down your answers in the um, chat. 
don't want to really come out here. I can't really monitor the chat, so think about this well. Um, so I'll give you about one minute. Um, Emily, if you could just help to see if what people write in the chat, because I can't really see, because I might ha I'll have to come through the power out of PowerPoint. A lot of learning is B. Um, then we're getting a lot of schema is C and mathemagnetic. Ma mathemagnetic. Yeah. <laughs> that is a tricky one. Um, yeah. Is a lot of those are coming out as A, so we're go we are going B, C, and A. A lot of people. Fantastic. So that is great. That's precisely what I wanted you to understand. So we've understood our keywords, and now we're just going to get into the meat of the theories of learning. Thanks for that, Emily. So um, you've probably all seen this quote before, where it says, "You can lead a horse to water, but the only water that gets into his stomach is what he drinks." Ernst um, Rothkopf begins his um, 1970 article on how people learn with this above um, metaphor. For Rothkopf, while learning depends on what is offered, for example, for water, it depends more what the learner does with what is offered, for example, they drink, so their actions. To learn, we must cognitively process what is offered, whether and how we process the incoming information determines what we learn and what we remember. As a result, crafting the appropriate task design is important in order to engage students with the desired cognitive process we want our students to engage with. We must ask ourselves, does this task match with the historical cognitive processes I want students to engage with? Going back to Ernst Comp's point, in this sense, you could say that students have veto power over their learning. If they read a text or listen to a lesson and are focused on the facts, then they will learn and probably remember the facts. In contrast, if while reading or listening, they think about how to use the information, then they'll hopefully learn how to apply it. As a result, where effective task, um, this is where effective task design can help. And of course, if they don't do anything with the information, then they'll learn nothing. In other words, you as a teacher can offer everything, but in the end, it's the learner who has the last word. The learner has to process the material that you offer, and this process of processing is what ultimately determines what's learnt. What, that doesn't mean that you don't have anything to do or add in the equation. You can be the driving force to stimulate students to carry out the activities that promote learning. Um, the learner's cognitive processing during the learning is a major, major contributor to what is learned. Therefore, we have to continually think, how does this activity promote or generate um, the learning in which they have at hand. We need to ensure that our, our activities do not eclipse, nor do they interfere or disturb or distract the understanding and knowledge we want our students to engage with. This normally happens when we prioritize engagement over learning. In essence, what I'm trying to emphasize is that is what is learned depends largely on the activities given on the student to complete. Therefore, it's imperative that we examine the learning activities, for example, the drinking habits um, of the students. Sometimes we focus too much on the behavioral activity. For example, I've been guilty of doing group work um, in the past because I'm being observed and to make it more or appear more engaging. But then we don't have enough thought on the cognitive activity we want students to engage with. Doing this does not necessarily cause learn. Doing things, I should say, does not necessarily cause learning. But thinking about what you are doing does cause learning. Learning work works by engaging in appropriate cognitive activity during the learning. So implications for the layout of our worksheets or resources. Rothkopf looked at how students learn from written materials and found three main ways to do it. You've got orientation. This means getting students interested and focused on what they need to learn. It includes grabbing their attention, keeping them engaged and managing anything that might distract them. So this has more to do with behaviour, management, classroom env environment and checks for um, listening in order to maintain their attention. Then you've got object acquisition. This is, a, this is about guiding students to pay attention to specific things and study them in a certain way. We will look at an example of this in practice soon. I'm sure you might have already a task idea in mind that links to object acquisition. 
And then finally, we've got translation and processing. Here it's about influencing how students understand and process the material that they're reading. This involves how they think about it internally, like turning words into thoughts, and how they process the information in their brain while breaking it down into smaller parts. We will come back to number two and three and look at what that looks like in practice soon. Um, before we do look at um, what object acquisition and translation and processing looks like in practice, let's explore generative learning. So generative learning is centered around the concept that learning is more effective when learners actively engage with the material. Generative learning involves various cognitive processes such as selecting relevant information, organizing it into coherent structure, integrating it with prior knowledge, and en engaging in generative learning strategies during the learning process helped facilitate effective cognitive processing. In essence, generative learning requires that learners apply appropriate cognitive processes during their learning. Learning is like building something new in our students' mind. When you learn, you're not just absorbing information passively. Instead, you're actively trying to understand it. This means paying attention to important details, organizing them in your head to make sense, and connecting them to what you already know. It's like putting together pieces of a puzzle to create a clear picture. So a quick progress check before we continue. Um, object acquisition is, is it A, B, or C? Translation and processing is A, B, or C? All gener and generative learning is A, B, and C? And then number four, you have to um, finish off that sentence by yourself. So I'll give you about a minute to do that and then I'll need Emily's help again to help yeah. me monitor the chat. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I am here and ready. I love the stuff that you're talking about so far. I really like that first thing you said about focusing on a uh, summer, on less tasks and making sure that they are done well because a lot of the variety in the diet comes from all the different teachers. So you don't necessarily need to vary yours as much. I think that's yeah. really good. And it's obviously this all links to that idea of not overwhelming our students as well. So some great things so far, Emily. Thank you. Nothing much coming through on the chat yet. So those of you, I do like the fact that you're treating us like we're in a lesson. <laughs> this is, this uh, really, uh, really appeals to my geeky side. <laughs> I'll just wait for a second. So if you know what the answers are to these, put them in. Or if you can finish that sentence, generative learning involves various cognitive processes such as what what does generative generative learning involve so what does it involve based on what we have done today also i think they're left that definitely people are slightly less uh, confident on this but we are getting okay. for 1c 2a yeah. and 3b they're a lot more confident on generative learning is b than any of the others but yeah well yeah. looks like we're going yeah. for c a and b yeah, so C, oh, so C, B, and it should say A, so I've got it typo with my, <laughs> yeah. with, with my part, sorry. And then number four is generative learning involves various cognitive processes such as selecting, organising and integrating. Thank you, guys. Um, so if we go back to um, our key terms on orientation, object acquisition and translation and processing, um, if you can share in the chat, what activity ideas come into mind especially when you think of object acquisition or translation and processing so i'll give about a minute as well what activity ideas um in our context of history comes into mind especially about guiding students to pay attention to specific things any ideas so just waiting for people to type things is it i would be thinking about use of sources for this maybe that's a good point that's a good one i've been guiding <laughs> at various points with the sources oh, thanks yeah. back thanks simply <laughs> and then just waiting for a few more people to put ideas in um because of time i'll just move on but feel free to share yeah, if um, anything comes up, I'll let yeah. you know. When I read Rothko's research on how students learn from written materials, I automatically thought of guided reading. As we've seen in generative learning theory, the learner's cognitive processing plays a central role in generative learning. Learning is not simply a process of adding information to memory, as in a computer. Instead, learning depends on both 
what is presented and on the learner's cognitive process in during learning. Simon here takes um, guided reading one step further, which I really like his layout, by organising questions into before, during and reading activities. Um, the general um, generative learning theory reveals that learners' prior knowledge um, plays a central role in generative learning. In the before box, as you can see in the top, um, prior, you can see the element of prior knowledge come into play. Prior knowledge includes schemas, categories, models and principles that can help guide what the learner selects for further processing, how the learner organises it and how the learner links it with their other structural um, similar knowledge. Thus, learning depends on both what the instructor presents and what the learner brings to the learning situation from prior learning. Um, Simon sets up this task really well with that before box. Um, in the during box, he explicitly guides students as to where students can find the information in the text, linking back to Rothkamp's theory of object acquisition. The translation and processing aspect is evident in the after box, where students have further opportunity to make sense of what they're reading and translate their knowledge into a new way, making students' knowledge more flexible and adaptable. So how does learning work according to the generative learning theory? So we're just going to break it down, what the image that you see on the board. Generative learning theory says that when we learn, we're actually using our brains in certain ways. There's a model, model called SOI model that explains this. It has three main parts, selecting, organizing, and integrating. So here's how it works. When we encounter new information, it briefly goes into our sensory memory. Then our brains pick out the important stuff and move it to our working memory for deeper thinking. In our working memory, we can organize this information into clear thoughts and connect it with stuff we already know from our long-term memory. This newly organized knowledge stays with us for future use, helping us solve problems in the real world. So what does this mean for learning? Teachers should make sure students are really thinking about and working with the information they're learning, not just memorizing it. And students should focus on actively processing the information that they are learning. Um, this differs from root learning that focuses more on memorizing and students should focus on actively processing the information they're getting rather than trying just simply to remember it. As a result, we want students to think hard because when they think hard, they remember more. Therefore, it's crucial that we, um, we carefully examine the learning activities we provide students to ensure they're promoting deep active historical thinking. But how can we achieve this? Through generative activities. Fiorella and Mayer came up with a series of activities which they argue actively encourage students to select information from the learning materials, which they can then organise and integrate into their schemas alongside their prior knowledge of the topic. Their research is based on 25 years of research in, um, effective learning, on the, into effective learning strategies. Here are a list of activities which they found to be the most effective in terms of generative learning. These strategies increase the visibility of what's going on in the learner's mind as far as that is ever possible. It also gives us a really strong indication of what the students need to do once we have worked through the effective instruction for them. These activities help learning stick. Research supports this approach with one study showing that students employing generative um, strategies outperform their peers on tests of comprehension by much of 30%. I will only focus on the top four, which is summarizing, mapping, drawing, and imaging. So generative activities. Um, our first one that we will explore is summarizing. Summarizing involves selecting key information. This is a skill that students need to have in history as they need to be able to select relevant evidence, facts, or quotes to be able to support their claims. Therefore, summarizing gives students the opportunity to continually practice the skill of selecting. Summarizing creates deep learning as it forces students to extract the key information, make links and associations with new material, and then make associations with material which is already stored in their existing schemas. In essence, it forces students to think hard about what they are reading. 
Summarization has been shown to increase retention and learning as it encourages students to attend to both the high meaning of a material and the gist of it. Please refer to the example of materials through the QR codes that you can see. Uh, but please note that upon reflection, even in my own um, practice, I feel that the lessons we've um, I've created have become an overload of activities. Therefore, returning from my secondment, I need to rework lessons to streamline the, um, the activities that are being done and focusing more on um, creating lessons around a text. Um, another way we can use summaries, this is an example of what I've done with uh, my year 12s. Summarising is not just good for embedding knowledge, but also good for helping students to understand interpretations. In my current teaching context, I'm working with year 12 students, many of whom are EAL. Because of this, I've had to carefully consider how to help them grasp the text. To build their understanding, we follow a step-by-step -step process. First, students skim through the text and circle any words they don't understand. Then they find out what those words mean and what it looks like using Google Images. They then summarise the interpretation in their own words in no more than four bullet points. I like to use simple technique uh, where, they, where I draw um, on the board two stick figures to represent two different perspectives um, on a particular issue so that they really picture the debate. Once they've summarised the interpretation, we move on to applying that knowledge to answering the question. I prompt them to consider whether the extract agrees or disagrees with the statement posed in the question, and then ask them how do they know in which they need to provide me with a quote. This process helps them to develop a deeper understanding of a material and how to effectively apply it into different contexts. Um, how to help students summarise. So this is a skill that is quite hard to teach our students. Teaching students to summarise effectively can be challenging. It requires us to reflect on our own mental processes when condensing information. One technique I find useful is called blackout, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. This method involves students using a black marker to eliminate unnecessary detail or waffle from the essential core knowledge they need to remember. However, guiding students to recognise and comprehend the core knowledge they need is another skill we must teach them. And that too, that too I've not myself mastered yet. If we return back to this tweet activity, I'm sure most of you saw, uh, yes, it is summarising, but I would argue it's not appropriate nor sensitive to the topic that is associated with. And therefore, I agree with what Mike Hill um, said in the sense that it would be far better um, for students to read the real experiences of soldiers from the trenches in their own words and then get students thinking hard about this instead. Another activity, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you do already, is mind mapping. Mind mapping is a common activity, but how can we make it more effective? Mapping helps students organise seemingly unrelated information into a logical structure. John Hattie explains that our minds struggle with unstructured data, so we need to find organisation and meaning in what we learn. Mind mapping allows us to visually represent our evolving understanding of a topic by constructing our schemas. Um, creating concept maps requires students to actively engage with the information by selecting what they consider relevant. This prom prompts them to think deeply and aids memory retention. They also must decide where to place the information in relation to other concepts on their map, considering connections and hierarchies. Sorry. Concept mapping enables students to integrate new information with their existing knowledge, forming hooks for learning, making their schemas explicit. It also provides opportunities for retrieving previously learned materials. In mind maps, organising information under headings such as long-term, short-term causes, what happened, consequences, is a great way to st help students structure, structure their notes. You can also get students to transform a story into a concept map, breaking the narrative down into headings like what happened, why, impact, or who, what, why, where, and when. Encourage students to extract key information and interact with it, thoughtfully fostering deeper meaning. And this is great for causation tasks. 
Another underestimated task, I believe, is drawing. Drawing is another powerful generative learning strategy. Despite being sometimes underestimated as an easy or lower order task, it actually requires deep engagement with the material. When you draw, you're not just copying information from one place to another. You're transforming it from text or speech into a visual form. The process forces you to truly understand the material and organize it visually. This process forces you to truly understand the material and organize it. It also taps into concepts, as you most all know, dual coding, where you process information through both auditory and visual channels. By combining text with relevant um, images, you avoid overloading any single channel and provide two sources of information to learn from. However, drawing can sometimes be challenging and distract from learning. Teachers can support students by demonstrating how to draw key concepts or providing um, partially completed drawings to scaffold the process. Research shows that students who um, use drawing to explain concepts perform better on tests compared to those who don't. This underscores the um, effectiveness of drawing as a learning tool, especially when students receive appropriate guidance. In summary, Drawing is a valuable learning strategy, but it's essential for teachers to ensure that drawing process is manageable for students, allowing them to focus on the learning rather than the act of drawing itself. So, for example, as you can see here is an example of picture notes created by my students depicting Henry VII's actions in France. These visual aids help solidify the narrative in their minds, paving the way for deeper analysis and discussion in sub subsequent lessons. So here's how it works. I begin using a visualizer to show students the start of a story and they continue the narrative using information from their textbook. Throughout the activity, I pause at various points to encourage China talk and discussion. For instance, I might ask person A to, narr to, narr 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 to um, explain, for example, to their partner, Henry VII's actions with France up until 1525, using only their picture notes. And then person B picks up where they left off and tells the remainder of the story only using their picture notes. This activity not only um, allows students to actively engage with the material, but also enables students to rehearse the story through turn and talk. Here is a concept map of why Wolsey was unable to obtain a divorce. This student didn't want to use pictures, so I just let her organise her notes in this way. Here is another example of picture notes of Henry VII's actions in Spain. This is an example of a year 11 using picture notes to explain why Hitler comes into power. The most effective aspects of picture notes for me is the use of the arrows in gaining insight of students' understanding of a relationship between each event, which differs from a traditional storyboard. Nevertheless, storyboards are still useful and effective. I have recently been thinking about how I can create more lessons around the text especially stories, instead of my lessons being overloaded with activities. Um, something I have written in my book is what students should be doing whilst the teacher is telling the story. One thing students can do is complete a storyboard. When we hear a story, our minds naturally conjure up images. Similarly, by engaging students in creating storyboards, we're helping them to visualise and solidify their understanding of a narrative. However, I did think um, about the split attention effect. Therefore, when I talked about how did Britain come to rule India, I gave students time to draw this, um, and this really helps students to make meaning of the information. This deliberate pause allows students to process the information more effectively and derive deeper meaning from the narrative. What else could students do with a storyboard before drawing? So before drawing, they could highlight key information, underline words they don't know, then use a dictionary to find out the definition of the word. And if they have a device like an iPad or a laptop, they can even find out what that image um, looks like using Google Images. As the saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, the final um, generative strategy I'm going to look at is um, imaging. Learning by imaging means creating pictures in your mind to understand what you're learning. So it's quite closely linked to drawing. For example, if you're studying how um, 
for example, if you're studying how, um, what have I got in mind? Um, castles. Having a picture of castles or Norman castles, I should say, will really help students um, picture whether if it was a status symbol or if it was a form of defense. Unlike drawing. That limit, Emily. Oh, we got, oh, I can't believe that it's gone really quick. But yeah. um, a good way, um, a good strategy to, a good um, article to read, especially in this, is Mike Hill's um, World Building. Um, imaging with interpretations helps us to also understand the metaphors and analogies I wanted to share. Um, there's um, a good article on teaching history that talks about using drawing as a form of assessment. I would recommend you reading that. Um, I did want to briefly talk about classification activities such as tables. We underestimate um, tables, um, card sorts as well, which um, Jonathan Grande um, recently wrote about. Um, I did want to talk about the impact of that. Um, the zonal relevance, as you know, most notably um, might know of, um, designed by Christine Council. Um, Venn diagrams and simple comprehension task um, that is, you know, that is really effective. Um, so, so much I wanted to talk about, but I also wanted to talk about visualization activities like living graphs, as we've um, seen before. Um, but yeah, um, a really good person to follow in terms of task design, I would say def definitely recommend would be Dan. Um, and then I had a few activities to do in terms of effective task design, but we didn't get um, we didn't get to that. But if I will, I'm, I'm sure that the PowerPoint will be sent out and we can continue this conversation um, at a later date. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And there was so much, obviously, that you could have continued talking about. I love the fact that there are so many familiar activities there, but it's about the nuance of thinking about what we're doing and why we're doing it and what purpose is it. And I think there's been some great links there as well between like that idea of prior knowledge, the things that Kerry talked about earlier. It just shows how big, um, how important that, that prior knowledge is. It plays a central role in everything we do. And I think that's going to come up again and again today. So we did have a break scheduled but unfortunately we are a little bit over time so we are going to be going straight into our interview with Christine Council in just a couple of minutes but before then can I remind you again please to share on social what things are you enjoying today what are your key takeaways from us remember our hashtag today is hashtag TT history so teachers talk history we have um also, with again, big thanks to our sponsors at Time Travel Education. You can go and check out what they offer in terms of both domestic and international trips, in-school experiences and their VR workshops as well. So please do go and check out Time Travel Education as well. We have just tweeted that as well. So you can go and find those links there. Now, I don't really feel like Christine Council needs much introduction, given that she is effectively an edgy, a history celebrity um, in our midst today. So we're very lucky that she has taken the time out to come and speak to us today. Um, her, Christine's current title is Director of Opening Worlds, which, which sounds amazing. And, and in very exciting news, has got a brand new set of books coming out with Hodder called Changing Histories. This is a set of textbooks that have taken a brand new approach through a story based approach, bringing together historical scholarship and inquiry, which presents a truly diverse, inclusive and ambitious history curriculum. The final thing that I would say before I pass over to Tom and Christine is that I don't think I can really introduce her any better than she introduces herself on Twitter as truth seeker, history geek and girly swap which I think a lot of us here can probably um, resonate with. And today she is going to be doing some truth seeking with us about her recent teaching history article about assessment. And I, for one, am going to be glued to my seat. So I will pass over to Tom and Christine. And thank you so much for giving up your time today. Welcome, Christine. How are you? Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Bottom left. There's a rookie error. Hey, thank you very much. You Thanks for inviting me, Tom. Yeah, thank you so much for, for doing this interview. We really, really appreciate it. And I know everybody is looking forward to what you have to say. Um, just in case anybody's unfamiliar, first off, with the sort of context of which we're talking about, um, there's an article and the title of which is Laughing Muppets, Lost Memories and Lethal Mutations, Rescuing Assessment from Knowledge Rich Gone Wrong, which you can find in Teaching History, just as a reference point. Um, and in this article, uh, Christine sets out her concerns about the effects on history teaching of recent trends in secondary assessment practice 
And this on a, I think it was like an eight page article. So this is a very, very brief summary from the conclusion, which we're going to dig into it properly. But in the conclusion, Christine says, if formative assessment relies on constructs unrelated to history's natural modes of accounting, in brackets, story, textured scene, argument, it misses multiple opportunities to make history more memorable and may damage pupils' experience of history itself. History lives, is learned, and carries meaning through its accounts. Um, now, Christine, I want to start off with when you initially shared this article on Twitter. You said it was going to put the cat amongst the pigeons. Can you tell everybody why that is? Yes. Um, well, let me let me explain why I, I decided to write it, Tom. Um, and, and thank you very much for asking me to talk about the article. It's in Teaching History 193, if anybody wants to look it up, because we're only going to be able to have a, have a brief time to get it. I think what drove me to write it is that, and I, I, this needs no introduction to the audience here, history is just a wonderful subject. It is amazing. It should be one of the subjects that make children want to come to school. Great, I've got history today. I want to go to school. And, and why is that? Well, just summing up, there's great diversity in what the greatest history teachers do. But, um, you know, I think there are two things which underpin those strengths. One is a quality of enchantment. Uh, that's a term I think that, that Jacob Olivey and, and Mike Hill often use, a quality of enchantment. It's like you cast a spell on the children, isn't it? A sequence of lessons goes somewhere. And it's often lots of little stories joined up, or it's one great big story, or it's a story you're then going to unpick and deconstruct. But that story is glorious. And the children are on their edges of the seats as you pace it. It's beautiful. It's enthralling. And you are captivated. They are enchanted for the duration of that inquiry. But secondly, alongside that is a puzzle. So you've usually got some sort of analytic direction, some inquiry question driving it through. And again, each lesson, you're thinking, oh, gosh, now I'm thinking about the puzzle in a different way. Oh, now we're looking at the inquiry question in a different way. And, and the teacher is guiding you to answer that question. And that's really, isn't it, how the substantive and disciplinary interact, the thrill of puzzle and the thrill of enchantment. But uh, alongside that, we could also say that history is a very important subject for reasons I don't need to rehearse to this audience. So it, it's something wonderful and extraordinary. We have sophisticated ways of bringing that out. It is critically important to bring children that historical consciousness. And yet we can damage it really, really badly through assessment. And really, I was motivated to write the article by making the point really that 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 damage is completely unnecessary. It shouldn't be necessary. We should be learning from the past. Um, so I make the point in the article at the start that we're not short on extensive and very easy to find solutions for great key stage three assessment. The good stuff isn't hidden or obscure. Teaching history is full of it. Um, you know, the, the, the blog that the HA does, one big history department is full of it. Um, yes, there are some history teachers who don't know about it, but often that's caused by really weak um, initial teacher training. There's no reason for anybody not to access great assessment. There's no shortage of models where assessment is doing a useful job and is not remotely interfering with the quality of pupils' experience of learning history. Um, but what triggered my um, de desire to write the article um, is really two problems. And one is very, very long standing. And that first problem, in a way, is a problem of, um, I like to think of it as collective amnesia, um, just a sort of collective forgetting um, in, in a system. And it's, this doesn't just affect history, of course. Uh, collective amnesia going back for ooh, 35 years. And this is the ever recurring problem of taking a hierarchy of skill based descriptors designed for summative purposes and then using that hierarchy to assess formatively i.e. In, in routine, embedded day-to-day -day assessment or in half-termly progress checks. And in the article, I point out the deadening, stultifying effect that such assessment has on history teaching and how every time it happens, it is frequently widely observed and helpfully analysed by many people, teachers, leaders and others. And yet, despite that, despite the fact that it's exposed as being a problem, uh, the problem then returns. And I chart the way in which it has returned three times since 1991. And I wanted to use the article to point out, and I suppose this is my cat among the pigeons, perhaps, to point about the very high likelihood that the same problem will recur again. 
It's recurred three times, it'll recur a fourth time. We're in a slight, but very fragile, I would say, lull from it at the moment, uh, since the 2019 Ofsted framework finally caught up with a growing consensus on the ground on this. Um, after that damage, I would say, had been substantially worsened by Ofsted before 2019. And the other problem, so that's the skill-based descriptor hierarchy problem that keeps recurring. But the other problem, which was my second cat among the pigeons, is the problem which has perhaps caused a bit of a rumpus. Um, and on the face of it, it is a completely new problem. But do see the article where I show the connection with the old problem. Um, and that is the one that I've styled as knowledge rich gone wrong. And this is a double tragedy. Knowledge rich gone wrong and damaging assessment is a double tragedy because the very thing which has long helped to counter the problem of skill based descriptors, a proper attention to the flow and form of historical knowledge is, in my view, becoming highly distorted in some current pedagogy and related assessment, uh, which is being imposed on history departments. Um, let me say, Christine, when I read the article, I, I'm going to put my hands up. I'm guilty because in in. But I did get out of it in your article, though, because it said it happened in 2014 when I made a skill based um, descriptor. So. I felt bad, but good, because I was like, oh, it happened in 2014. That makes me okay, you know. Yeah, you, you redeemed, Tom. <laughs> yeah. You, you said in there, I mean, tell us a little bit more mm. about the problem of the first two issues that you raised with these mm. skills-based descriptors. What, what's the problem with relying on them? There might be some history teachers watching this. I know we've got a lot of international history teachers watching. They might not know what you're talking about here. So it'd be great to give them that, that context. Sure, delighted, thank you. I mean, what I mean by this, I think the best way of characterizing it quickly and practically is that it typically takes the form of an over-reliance on command verbs. So I'm talking about, and then a creation of a hierarchy out of those command verbs, uh, for example, leading into a question. So for example, identify, describe, explain, evaluate, analyze, you know, the sort of thing. And then treating that as, as an assumed hierarchy. And it also takes the form of a, of a related attempt often to isolate properties of disciplinary thinking. So let's look at what progress in causation looks like. OK, we'll break that down into I can find a cause. I can find lots of causes. I can link causes. I can classify causes. I can do a full dance with bananas and causes. So, you know, this assumed hierarchy, the isolation into a set of skills, which feels very tidy. It looks like you're capturing a thoroughly good thing. We all know that learning to argue causally is a thoroughly good thing, but actually it's profoundly distorting. And we see this in the old level descriptions, which were abolished in 2014, um, but we also see it in um, uh, an, uh, an improper use, an overuse of GCSE questions and GCSE mark schemes where they're used inappropriately lower down the school. Now, what it can't um, describe, what those kinds of hierarchies of skilled descriptors can't describe, can't allow you to measure and certainly can't provide the means for is actually getting better at history because it's trying to capture the final performance, the wonderful causation argument uh, the exam answer, perhaps, and to sort of carve it up and imagine that the journey towards it is a sort of carving up of those final attributes. The reality is the way in which we become proficient at history, the way in which we learn to move about within our knowledge sufficiently to do something interesting with it doesn't look like that it looks completely different. We have to move through a series of things, including getting really, really secure in the knowledge, including experiencing different forms of argument and practicing different forms of argument. And it's like a, a faulty breaking of it down into spurious components. And if you try to use it for formative assessment, if you try to use it routinely, uh, worst of all, kind of day to day assessment, you know, parking a level on a particular piece of work, you get really horrible distortions. Now, why don't they work? They don't work because they're an inevitably faulty hierarchy. Um, you know, I can evaluate X. Well, I can do that at postdoctoral thesis level, but I could also teach an eight year old to do it perfectly competently. The difficulty relates to the range, specificity, accuracy, um, diversity and richness of, and appositeness of knowledge. It doesn't relate to that particular verb, evaluate or identify. Secondly, they don't work because they leave out substantive knowledge. And thirdly, they don't work because they imply a spurious precision, which distorts that steady, rich, 
slow burn, if you like, an indirect process of truly teaching disciplinary thinking and argument. And they invariably supplant curriculum itself. So, you know, the history curriculum, what we teach children, the substance children learn, is there to change the child. It's there to alter what the child sees, what the child recognises, and therefore what the child can do. But if you jump over that curriculum, if you confuse performance with learning, you not only don't bring about that change, but you create damaging assessment, which actually yields a set of lies. So before, if you think about before level descriptions were abolished, pre-2014, you know, his, the heads of history were under pressure to show that X proportion of children had reached level seven. But what did level seven me mean? It meant that children could practice a formula. Or, and now often it's, you know, pushing them up to be able to practice the formulae for a level two or level three of a GCSE mark scheme. And yes, the child can rehearse the formula to perfection. So why isn't that always translating then into, say, a grade five in GCSE? Well, it's because you're trying to replicate the wrong thing. We're teaching to the performance rather than learning. And when the bulk of your teaching at key stage three or your frequent six weekly interruptions to your teaching are geared to this, you're not only going to get meaningless data, but you won't help pupils to improve. And worst of all, we just create a dreadful, joyless experience of history teaching. And in the article, I chart the continuities in this over 35 years. But what's much more depressing, the thing I really wanted to focus on is this. It's the fact that there have been repeated, collective, widely understood realizations that all this is a problem. And yet, despite that collective realization, usually within a few years, the whole thing gets reinvented again. And do read the article, everybody. But, you know, there, uh, there I chart how that has happened three times. Um, the abolition of level descriptions in 2014 was one of these realizations. It's perhaps the most recent one. Um, well, it's not it's the kind of one in the middle, if you like. Uh, the recent one came later. The abolition of level descriptions in 2014 arose from one of these realizations that there was a real problem, that real damage was being caused. But then the whole problem was invented a third time, but this time with a new atrocity for good measure the use of GCSE questions and mark schemes at key stage three, which is simply more generic skill based descriptors, turning the teaching of history into the drilling of crazy formulae, which have nothing to do with good history teaching and certainly nothing to do with um, gaining the substance and studying the structure of historical knowledge. Now, last point on this, all this was only halted in 2019 by a new Ofsted framework, which was a radical turnaround, one which actually caught up, Ofsted was catching up with what many teachers, especially history teachers, had been saying for some time. And in a deliberate attempt to stop it, they said inspectors would not look at internal data. And they emphasized um, that the curriculum, the curriculum itself is what creates progress. So look at the quality of the curriculum, look at how well the curriculum is being learned, and not a, a spurious and premature clambering through GCSE mark schemes. There's two parts to the next question I've got based on that, uh, Christine. Part one is you seem very sure this is this is going to happen again in, in within that chronology. So part A is why do you think that? And the second part of that is also just reflecting on what you said that if if the inspection framework has changed, if level descriptor has been abolished, if uh, you know, there's less focus on pure data for schools and et cetera, et cetera. Now, what's driving it? What's what sort of what, why are you so worried this is going to happen again? Why is it going to happen? Again? Yeah, a really important question. Thank, thank you for asking that. I would say there's two reasons why I'm, I'm worried. Um, the first is uh, I said, you know, 2019 has given the good history teacher cover um, so that you could cover to do the right thing. Uh, but that's all it's done. It's given them cover to do the right thing in some settings. I would say that that old problem hasn't completely gone away. That's the first reason. Even with Ofsted being pretty clear about these dangers of um, assessment supplanting curriculum and uh, rowing back on looking at internal data, what is striking is how many schools, and this is a school level problem, not a history teacher level problem, how many schools have still clung to this practice of GCSE mark schemes at key stage three, and even using it for, for flight paths, for example, and, and making predictions. 
And we've got some reasonable data on this. I think the best sampling you're going to get of it, which is Tim Jenner's most recent, uh, the uh, um, HMI in charge of history in Ofsted, Tim Jenner's most recent Ofsted subject report, which estimates around 50% of schools still do this. Now that you can see that as glass half full, glass half empty. On the one side, on the one hand, that's great because I think it was probably in the 90s before, uh, so it's only 50%. Or you can say, well, how very worrying. Even with Ofsted creating a climate that discourages these practices, 50% are still clinging onto it, and that makes me worry really that the transformation is fragile and that where it has happened, it might have happened through compliance rather than through conviction, which is always very worrying. Um, but the the other reason why I think it won't um, it, it it will come back is not just that it hasn't fully gone away, is that it is intrinsically seductive. And this answers the second part of your question. If you think about it, we all want history so much more than just knowing stuff. It's being able to do something with that stuff, and we want children to be critical. We want them to have disciplinary thinking, and, and you know that's so well established, isn't it, in our communities over thirty plus years. So of course, sooner or later, someone comes along and says, right, well, this evaluating is really important, isn't it? This construction of argument is really important, isn't it? So let's assess it as it goes along. Let's find a hierarchy of skills which shows progression in that thing. And before you know it, someone's reinvented it. So I think there's something about it being intrinsically seductive. It's about the deceit of the obvious. So I think this transcends any issues of predicting around, you know, what might be happening in terms of policy circles or current or future Ofsted. I think there is something intrinsically seductive about that model, which means that those who don't know that history, those who haven't been brought up in it and helped to reflect on it in great history ITT, for example, or those perhaps who haven't got senior leaders who think about these things are very, very vulnerable to it happening again. Do you think, though, just to play devil's advocate, there is a disconnect between what is expected within GCSE exams, for example, for history and how they're marked? With Can, can you sort of see why a yeah. history teacher might think, hang on a minute, right? At the end of the day, a lot of the students, whether we like it or not, might not be engaged with history as a subject. They might not like it, um, they, you know, and... I suppose there might be something seductive of saying, well, let's try and prepare them for the exam. I know that's a sort of... Yes, but that, thing that's, that's depressing, isn't it? That's depressing. And, and I totally agree. I think I'm sure that does exist. But that is a, that's a broader comment too, isn't it, on system and culture. You know, leadership of schools should be about challenging that, shouldn't it? It shouldn't be something that, that falls on the, on the back of the history teachers. Are we doing the thing that intrinsically matters here? Am I incentivizing doing the thing that intrinsically matters? I mean, once you've said, I've given up on this child finding history interesting, or at least I'll get them through the exam, you have failed, you have lost. And I don't blame a history department if they feel they've reached that point and the enabling conditions are not present and maybe they haven't had the training or the experience and senior leaders are demanding something of them. So I don't blame the history department for doing that. I think that is a reality, but is in effect of a system and a culture that isn't placing first, isn't making the primary duty of a senior leader to ask, uh, the primary duty of a senior leader to be interested in subjects if a senior leader is first and foremost interested in creating a narrative, a management narrative, before they're interested in the business of understanding truly subjects and what it is that genuinely helps children to get better, then it's going to be very, very hard for this problem to go away. So we need broader systems and policy to incentivize that. Let's focus on the, the bit where you were talking about knowledge rich going right, knowledge rich going wrong. Um, what can you tell everyone a little bit about what you think knowledge rich going right looks like yeah thank you thanks for asking that first <laughs> it's so easy to get into the depressing bit isn't it yeah so i, I i'm going to sum it up in three ways three things that i would say just sum it up at a high level of, of what knowledge rich going right looks like i would say number one a knowledge rich history curriculum as i understand it, and i don't see this as a new thing i think it's something history you know this isn't something that sort of emerged in some recent govian influence <laughs> you know that that might have allowed it to get some some daylight and it, it certainly certain currents allowed it to come out but this is something quite long-standing it's had a long gestation period amongst many stables of history teachers so the first thing I would say is that a knowledge-rich history curriculum paints complex worlds on human scale 
It doesn't try to oversimplify them in unhelpful ways. Those past worlds, those distant, strange past worlds, um, get imagined through, through very rich and vivid detail in a knowledge-rich curriculum. Rich and vivid detail that paints material culture, spiritual culture, and through that, through that human scale, through those stories of real people, those real examples, it helps pupils to understand the more abstract things, alien institutions, complex past ideas, unfamiliar motivations or, or moralities. And without this um, hinterland of world building, I uh, heard Emily mention world building at the end there, at the end of her, her lovely presentation, without this kind of hinterland of world building and this quality of enchantment that it brings, um, where, where pupils are seduced by story into seeing and being interested in, say, the texture of, of an institution, many of those abstract phenomena will remain inaccessible abstractions, uh, especially for pupils who are, who are hitherto low attainers or have certain special needs. So that's the first thing. It paints complex worlds on human scale. The second thing I would say is a knowledge-rich history curriculum weaves narratives. It weaves and connects narratives which operate on different scales, and within differing spheres of human action. And um, storytelling is not just a, a pedagogic device in history, it's the way meaning is made. It is the very object of study too. So history's chief mode of accounting is narrative and without narrative, nothing is ever stated other than free floating fact. So knowledge rich history stays close to that natural mode of accounting. It doesn't distort it with alien constructs like skill hierarchies. Thirdly, and most important of all, perhaps, a knowledge-rich history curriculum trains children to question those narratives. And this is because those narratives are always constructs. They're ones which, which can wield power, even dangerous power, through subtle influence and, and hidden argument. So this, I think, uh, this third point is really the disciplinary dimension, isn't it? It's about inducting pupils into traditions of responsible argument and their standards of evidence and fostering pupils' confidence that as, as citizens of a democracy, they have a right and a duty to engage with those long traditions of inquiry, those long traditions of debate, and a right and duty to renew those traditions and debates by joining them and joining those inquiries themselves. So three things, um, painting the past in painting uh, complex worlds in human scale, weaving narratives and questioning those narratives. That for me is what knowledge rich history is all about. I've got a couple of questions left, Christine, uh, just to finish off. Before we jump into those, it's probably a good time for me to give a shout out to our sponsor today, which is Time Travel Education, um, who, who are a fantastic uh, tour company and VR agency for history teachers. So if you're interested in finding out more, you can visit them at timetraveleducation.co.uk and find out a little more, bit more about them. The other thing I'd like to mention at this point as well, if you're enjoying this event, we have our science event next month on the 20th of April in Manchester. It's completely free for classroom teachers. So if you have a scientist that you know in your history department or who happens to be anywhere in the UK, actually, uh, who wants to travel to Manchester and join us for that free event on the 20th of April, definitely check out ttradio.org forward slash events. Uh, you'll find it listed on there with a link to the ticketing and definitely get involved. Uh, we've got an amazing, I think we've got more than 15 amazing speakers um, and it's going to be fantastic. So, Christine, just to move on to the last few questions now. Um, it all sounds, what you've just described there, it all sounds like really good history teaching, almost mainstream history teaching, what people consider that to be now. So how does it go wrong in the context of assessment in particular? Yeah. Yeah, this and this is the chief cat among the pigeons, isn't it? So I would say, Tom, that um, just as with the um, skill based descriptor hierarchies where you've got an alien construct. Um, so with this, we find an alien construct gets imposed on history teaching that completely distorts the learning. Um, so just as with the, if you think back to what I said about the skill based descriptor hierarchy, um, that was taking the principles of final performance and trying to fast track them without doing the deeper work of the curriculum. So with knowledge rich gone wrong, I see an alien construct being created. And what I'm observing is 
up and down the country in many different settings, the same sort of thing going on. And my concern is, in effect, if I can sum it all up with something very provocative, my, my concern is that teachers are being expected, and I stress again, it's rarely coming from history teachers themselves. My concern is that history teachers are being expected to make history behave like science. Now, I explained this in, in, in That's depth. That's a good quote, that. We should, we should tweet that one out, Emily, in okay. the background. That's a really good quote. Yeah. Can you and say I, it again? Can you say yeah. that again? Okay, like yeah. it. So my concern is that teachers are often, we should stress, because it's not happening everywhere, but often being expected to make history behave like science. And, you know, I wouldn't want it to happen the other way around. I wouldn't want science teachers to make expect science to behave like history. I don't want anyone to have their subject uh, made to behave like another subject. Um, yeah. So I, I explain this in depth in the article and I won't try to go into all the corners of it right now. But let me give you um, one example, just one example I refer to in the article. And I think it's one that people will recognise. So and, and this can be subtle. You know, it can be a good thing that then gets distorted into a bad thing because it's lost connection with the subject. My example is a kind of routinized use of retrieval practice. So talking now at the very formative and informal end of assessment here, which is very regular, but a routine use of, of retrieval practice that has lost connection with the subject's natural forms of accounting. And this is really sad because narrative and argument, and narrative with argument in the middle of it, narrative and argument, history's natural modes of accounting, provide really easy and highly purposeful opportunities to retrieve prior knowledge. You know, as, as the plot unfolds, as the scene opens out, as the, um, you know, the inevitable desire to predict galvanizes uh, a pupil's imagination, the story's journey itself, you know, prompts retrieval. You think how a novel works, think how a film works. It, it does it brilliantly and subtly and integrates it. So inviting explicit retrieval at that moment can feel part of the narrative flow. So let's take an example. So let's say we're studying, I don't know, Baghdad in the ninth century, take a, a popular, increasingly popular key stage three topic, although really it's, it's in the primary curriculum. Um, and here we are, we're enthralled by, by the passion of the caliphs for seeking out knowledge and we're, we're fascinated by the fact that the, the caliphs are even going to their byzantine enemies to get the knowledge of the ancient greeks why are they doing that okay let's remember year seven why is all that knowledge in the byzantine empire where is it in the byzantine empire and what form would it take you know, at that moment, you're 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 crying out for that prior knowledge. You need it. You want it at that moment, and it's going to unlock what's going to be new. It's the ideal moment to retrieve it in an appropriate way. So systematic recall can be a really really good thing. It's essential, in fact, and it can add to the suspense. And similarly, in disciplinary terms, the recall of particular material can support structured stages in an unfolding analysis. The journey towards an inquiry question, the journey of shaping an argument in response to an inquiry question. Yet often, I don't hear that, I hear we've been told to have a quizzing exercise at this point in the lesson. Or worse than that, this quizzing exercise must have five questions, or it must be multiple choice. So rather than being assisted and strengthened by the retrieval which proceeds from the story we're in or the analysis we're pursuing and an appropriate form for that retrieval. Children's memories are actually being overloaded sometimes. What an irony there is there, their memories are being overloaded with clunky or decontextualized questions only loosely related to the account being shared or shaped. Now, there are many other examples in the article, and my particular crossness in the article is reserved for the abuse of knowledge organizers. I won't even get started on that because I'll, I'll start, I'll set the computer on fire with my crossness. Um, but um, what, what's going wrong here? I'll, I'll just conclude with this because I think it's important to get at the root of it. I think what's going wrong here with this sort of clunky, inappropriate recall that's actually not helping memory and is interrupting history in unhelpful ways is best explained by the principle of semantic gravity. Now, bear with me here, because this is actually really helpful. It's not just a pile of words. All subjects have a particular relationship, don't they, between the particular and the general. And subjects actually differ in the extent to which they need the generalization and the particular underneath it. And a subject with heavy semantic gravity is a subject that's pulled down, very naturally pulled down into its particulars, its detail, its story, its example, the colors and richness and drama. 
history has very heavy semantic gravity. You can't lose the generalizations. If you don't have generalizations, you can't talk about appeasement or economic effects or uh, tribal warfare. If you haven't got generalizations, you can't talk about anything. So you need a dance between the particular and the general. And actually all quality history teaching is dependent on getting that dance right. Most of great feedback that a coach or a mentor gives is around, was that right? Did we need more general? Did we need more particular here? So great history teaching stands or falls on how well the general and particular are woven. And the history teacher is always thinking about that. And in your routine, if your routine formative assessment is constantly making generalizations intrude at the wrong stage, those sort of higher level concepts and abstractions, without sensitivity to their role in the unfolding puzzle, without making use of the satisfying sense of arrival that comes when a narrative makes them make sense, then we're at best missing opportunities to motivate, enable, and, and, and make history joyous and memorable. And at worst, we're killing it dead and making it really, really hard to remember. What you don't want to do is overload working memory. And as I said here, there's a great irony here, because often these things are done in the name of, of, of cognitive science. Mm -hmm. And cognitive science is helpful when it's when it's mm -hmm. applied sensibly. Um, you don't want to overload working memory by inserting multiple choice just because you have to do it at that moment. What you don't want to do is reduce memorization to a knowledge organizer, which isn't helping with capturing historical meaning. Um, often because of its very poor or artificial relationship with the particulars that sustain it. So the last thing you want is assessment, which breaks the spell. Just before we move on to the last sort of question here, Christine, if anybody has a question to ask, obviously the chat is open there. So we might have time just for one or two really sort of quick fire questions at the end. So if you have a question based on anything we've discussed up to this point, please pop it in the chat and I'll try and pick one or two to to throw into the into the interview at the end so feel free to do that the second thing obviously is keep um tweeting your questions if you use twitter then or x sorry then you can use the hashtag tt history and and do that or um tag us in at ttr history um so christine lastly what does really great assessment look like in key stage three history Right. Um, I'm going to try and summarise this crisply because I know we're, we're run out of time and remind people there are lots of answers to this in the uh, article in Teaching History 193. I expect a lot of the questions being asked are probably answered there. And often they're not being answered by me, but I'm pointing you to other fantastic practice that is out there that we're all continuing to learn from that's shared in, in forums like this, like yours, uh, and also in Teaching History Journal and, and by the HA. But let me just try and pull it together. I would say really great assessment stays very close to history's natural forms of accounting, whether they are narrative or argument or a complex blend of the two. In formative assessment, the thing the teacher needs to be thinking about is what do I need to check pupils have recalled at this point? And when do I need to check it? And what kind of thing? And what is the role of that security, that absolute rock solid security I need in the knowledge, that automaticity um, in what we learned, say, last lesson or last week or last year? What role is that playing in placing pupils now in a heightened state of attention so they're ready as this particular bit of the new story unfolds? What's its role in opening up the new possibilities of the inquiry question, which we've been steadily unpacking across this lesson sequence. Or moving up to the sort of slightly more formal but still formative assessment opportunities, um, it might be, say, a test that you want to do between inquiries. So, so let's just take one example. We're, we're bang in the middle of year nine, say, and we choose to do an intensive really fast, perhaps surprise, perhaps we don't want to uh, do any revision for this, but a fast and intensive timeline test right here. And we are, we're not soft on the recall of knowledge. My goodness, we're thorough about it. Uh, but we want to make sure that our knowledge from the last two inquiries, and maybe an inquiry back in year seven or year eight, which is highly relevant to this one, is present for these pupils right now as we move into this new inquiry. Where we're going to need that old knowledge to make this new journey interesting. I'm going to need them secure in that vocabulary. 
I'm going to need them secure in those reference points, the places, the stories, because we're going to be showing a new comparison with them. Or maybe it's something that follows on. Perhaps I was studying East African societies uh, in the 10th century, and now I'm studying East African societies in the 14th century, whatever it is. Perhaps I'm studying Christianity or Islam in a different part of the world. I don't know. There's some connection. So I've got real reason to be rock solid secure in that old timeline. So I have a fast timeline and I set my standards really high and I want them to recall 100%. So it's not about going soft on recall at all, but I'm doing it right now because it's illuminating. I'm doing it right now because it will. it's efficient, because it's going to directly help the next thing. And I'm doing it right now because the children are not going to be bored because, you know, I want to follow that timeline up with some really interesting analysis of it, which will beautifully segue into what I'm going to do next. So the natural, this is what I mean about the natural mode of accounting. The, you know, not only are there are little narratives, but the whole thing can be thought of as a narrative. And you're choosing those moments and choosing what you will recall with great thoroughness so that they serve and complement and proceed from those natural modes of accounting and make history more accessible to more pupils. In the end, great ass assessment secures inclusion. I think that's the key point I'd want to end on. It allows you to check that all pupils have accessed and can retain the prior knowledge and, and thinking that is unlocking the doors to the new stuff. Um, and it doesn't end the enchantment. It doesn't break the spell. Christine, absolutely fabulous. Enjoyed that interview. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. We've, we've, we've already sort of over here. So it's, it's been amazing. Um, so many things to take away from that. And um, for me personally, in my history teaching, but I'm sure everybody listening and watching um, the same. Um, so thank you ever so much for joining us here. Pleasure. And um, hope, to, hope to check in again. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank well, Emily, that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> It was amazing. Yeah, I can't I almost can't quite take it all in. <laughs> Thank God this will be recorded and we can watch it afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go back to you now. Um, yeah. But thank you. Brilliant. So we are going to move straight on to Owen um, now. Owen is going to be talking about a, using a trip to the Imperial War Museum. We all love a good history trip. It's some of the things that really enthuse our students, not just in terms of academic history, but also that love, uh, that lifelong love of it. Owen has been teaching since 2010 and he has been head of history and politics at school in Southwest London. Um, just from what I have seen on his Twitter as well, his, uh, he has really worked to, to develop a broad and ambitious history curriculum, including an amazing 16 sets of booklet for his GCSE groups, which represents a phenomenal amount of work. So, Owen, over to you. Thank you, Emily. Um, I've got my timer here on my phone for 10 minutes, so we're counting down now. Um, right, okay, so I'm going to give you uh, a, a brief overview of a new inquiry that we've done with Year 9. It's focused on interpretation. Um, and as you mentioned, yeah, it's, it's a way of uh, trying to in incorporate a, a school trip to a museum into that uh, in a more uh, in a more fundamental way uh, than bolting it on. Um, so let's see if this slide clicks through. It does. Good. All right. So um, following on a bit from what Christine was saying about uh, interpretations and um, you know the need to look at the disciplinary aspect of you know, how history is constructed as a discipline. Uh, how historical knowledge is generated. Um, this was something that was was picked up on by, uh, as was previously mentioned in Tim Jenner's reports, um, uh, the HMI for history, uh, about you know, how historical interpretation is taught in schools. And that he, he found a lot of sort of inquiries that um, saw uh, uh, sort of put students in the position of many historians having to make a judgment about whether you know, a particular person from the past was a good guy or a bad guy. And um, for sure, in you know, these inquiries, which I'm, I'm talking about today, was, was really taking the place of an old inquiry into whether Haig was a was a blunderer and a, a, or a, a just you know, you know, essentially a, a donkey, as those old Latin uh, interpretations. Um, but instead trying to have something a little bit more fundamental about how uh, interpretations are created um, with respect to uh, World War One. Um, so, of course, we get a lot of our interpretations from the work of historians and work of historians is predom predominantly from uh, in the written form through books and so on. Um, but I was thinking uh, with uh, a trip in mind. Um, whether or not we could actually view a, a museum's gallery as a, uh, as a historical interpretation. 
um, because, of course, at its heart, it involves a, a, a process of selection about what to include, what to leave out, what uh, fundamental stories that want to be told, what narrative um, uh, is, is, has been prioritised and uh, which people and uh, uh, sort of concepts are, are being emphasised or de-emphasised. Um, so it, yeah, that led me on to, to think about whether or not actually we could we could do an interpretation inquiry around you know a, a museum exhibition, uh, with of course um, the Imperial War Museum in mind because uh, this was our main history trip for year nine. Um, we've been going there every year uh, since I was at the school, um, and you know we'd always uh, gone along and we'd, we'd gone through the World War One gallery and. Um, I created a 40 question fact test and the boys would go round and they'd, they'd you know, put the sheet up on the wall and write their answers down and get shouted at by uh, somebody for uh, you know making a mess. Um, and it really didn't really advance their knowledge any any further. Um, it was, you know, uh, you know, really just created extra marking for me in terms of you know, going through their quiz answers. And so I knew this being used very well and I wanted to create something that was much more integrated that really integrated it into our curriculum. Um, so as I say I, I joined the school in 2011 and um, at that time very shortly after that time the Imperial Museum was was partially closed as they uh, redeveloped the World War One uh, gallery for um, uh, in recognition of the centenary that was coming. And it reopened after a multi-million pound refurbishment in 2014, the middle of July. And you can see here uh, the Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron and Prince William uh, here at the opening. And it was received um, um, by public and uh, professional historians alike uh, with uh, great uh, acclaim, um, you know, compelling presentation that tells the story of Britain and its empire, uh, says Stevenson. Uh, Reynolds here focuses on the international story of the British world at war. Um, but surprisingly, just to, as the initial visitors were going in and out of the gallery and as the uh, you know, the opening party was being uh, put away. About a fortnight later, this book was published, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, telling the story of the forgotten soldiers of empire. Now, I didn't immediately pick up on it, and I, I probably like a lot of people, I didn't pick up it until recently as a result of, in 2020, the Black Lives Matters process and the increased focus upon um, our history and the degree to which it, it tells uh, a, a full story of you know significant world events such as the First World War. Um, and so um, there was also discussion, of course, at the time as I, I started to get into, uh, you know, through the uh, online history community, um, I came across the work of Trulio, um, who uh, talks about the ideas of historical, or the idea of historical silences, uh, about the fact that there, there are peoples uh, and stories from the past that, that occurred in the past, but have never actually made it into our history books, into our museums, that they've been, they've been forgotten. Uh, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. And he, he talks about here uh, the ways in which this happens. And this is a quote which we use with our Year 9 students as part of a, an introductory lesson into how the Imperial War Museum was, was created and uh, its archive. And it talks about the, the four crucial moments in which uh, of fact creation, uh, where silences can occur, such as in the making of sources. There are communities uh, that don't uh, leave a written record of their uh, of their past, uh, then they, they are likely to be forgotten by history. At the moment of fact assembly, you know, if the after the sources um, uh, we're trying to assemble a, a, an archive of uh, evidence from the past, if your you know, evidence of your uh, existence, of your story, of your community doesn't get um, preserved in an archive, then it's not going to make it through into selection for uh, for exhibitions in, where for historians to go and uh, retrieve from the archives and put it into their books and so on. So these these different levels uh, at which a, a, a historical science can occur uh, was an intriguing and quite accessible um, uh, principle uh, when you were going into uh, a trip to a museum, which of course based upon an archive. Um, my research then took me to uh, to to the Imperial War Museum itself. I went to the reading room and had a look at some of the um, design documents for the new World War One uh, curation, uh, new World War One exhibits. 
uh, but also had a look at, in the deepest, darkest depths of their website and came across this um, uh, quite interesting uh, page where uh, the Imperial War Museum has, has felt it necessary to describe the problems with its archive. And I'll, I'll quickly read through uh, a section of it here. So the Imperial War Museum has been collecting for over 100 years, and we first opened our displays in the summer of 1920 at the Crystal Palace. Our founders had an ambition to represent the stories of men and women around the globe, Looking back at what we've collected in that period, we have only been partially successful. White male narratives are over-represented. Our collections are geographically weighted towards the south of England. Collections of non-English perspectives are almost non-existent, except for a strong collection of oral history interviews. Our curators know this about our collections, and they're working to change it. And you, uh, as you delve into the depths of the uh, sort of origins of the Imperial War Museum its website, you can see this is this image here of essentially the first archive of the Imperial War Museum. And you know, this is really just a, a few items that were gathered from the Western Front um, and towards the end of the war uh, by uh, the museum's founders. So um, we came up with this inquiry question then, what stories has the Imperial War Museum chosen to tell us about World War One? with that word chosen being a particularly um, active um, uh, idea in the inquiry itself? Um, uh, so after an introductory lesson, sort of introducing the ideas of Trulio, looking at the, the origins of the Imperial War Museum, discussing the ideas of historical sciences and, and the problems with the archive, in particular why it's difficult for the Imperial War Museum to, do its, to deliver on its purpose to tell the stories of Britain and her empire given its archive. We then uh, spent a lesson each on uh, four different groups of forgotten, soldier, uh, forgotten soldiers, such as uh, or, or, uh, communities that were involved in World War One. So the Chinese engineers are on the Western Front, um, uh, Russians and Ottomans on the Eastern Front, um, on the Mesopotamian Front, looking at the role of uh, the Arab revolts, and also East African troops um, uh, down uh, in, in that continent. So that was really to uh, give the students um, the, uh, the substantive knowledge for them to then go to the Imperial War Museum and to look through the, uh, the gallery. We give them this, uh, this map here that you can see here, this is a floor plan. And the idea was then was to colour code it, showing which, part, which fronts from First World War does the gallery focus on. Um, does it you know, give a, a, an even coverage of, of all of the different fronts, East African Front, Mesopotamian Front, Western Front, and so on? Um, or does it focus on particular ones? Does it exclude any of them? And also a, a record there of objects. So they go around and take photographs of particular objects from different fronts and get the names of individuals uh, that, were, uh, that are uh, being remembered uh, in the, uh, in the uh, exhibition. And this was to allow them then to do a presentation. Uh, we have an or uh, oracy focus and uh, they did group presentations uh, focusing on, on uh, th three aspects uh, which fronts from the gallery uh, did uh, were given by the curators a major emphasis was a lot of focus on there's my alarm so I'm about to finish and you can see here that uh, the western front and the home front were particularly focused on um, which fronts were uh, given minor emphasis so where could you see aspects of um, uh, the stories from uh, Eastern Front and West, Middle Eastern Front, you see the, the certain occasions where they come in. Um, and then where were there actually some, some silences? And uh, in particular, everybody was identifying that the East African Front was something that the Imperial War Museum doesn't really uh, give us any information about at all. Um, so that's, uh, so you can see a few of the sort of images that they collected in relation to uh, Chinese um, laborers. There's a few little photographs, but they're not giving them much emphasis. Uh, and so that gave them a, a bit of an introduction into the idea of historical silences and the decision making that goes into the creation of, of a museum to see it as a, uh, as a historical interpretation as much as any, any historian's uh, book. There you go. Thanks for listening. Um, a really interesting concept using a, a, a museum and, and a gallery as interpretation. I think that's something that we could all use to make our um, history trips a little bit more um, 
have a little bit more purpose perhaps sometimes and really think about the types of history that we are teaching and what voices are present and which ones are forgotten. So thank you, Owen, some fantastic things to take away from that. So we are going to move on to Sarah Longer now, who is going to be giving us a talk about rethinking the British Empire and the power of material culture in the classroom. She is an associate professor in the history of empire at the University of Lincoln, her research explores the history of empire through material and visual culture, the history of museums and colonial collecting. She's previously worked as an education officer at the British Museum and she is now sharing her expertise with us this morning. What a fantastic way to revitalise the teaching of empire through the use of material culture. So um, just a very quick reminder to keep posting on socials, please. And remember that we are very, very thankful today to be sponsored by Time Travel Education. They specialise in bringing history to life through trips in both domestic and international in-school workshops and VR experiences. You can find out more by visiting them now on the QR screen, the Q QR code on screen, or by going to timetraveleducation.co.uk. I'm clearly running out of being able to speak, so I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who will hopefully do a better job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, and for that very warm welcome. Um, I think it's uh, an amazing lineup. It's quite tough to follow Christine and Owen straight in quick succession, so um, I hope that this will be useful for some of you. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to share this work with you, and I think there's a lot that really chimes with what Owen was just speaking about, so it's a, in, in a way it's a perfect kind of time for me to speak. Um, uh, and we're, in fact, we're going to be working with the Imperial War Museum, hopefully in the next phase of our project. Um, so this is work that I've been doing. I'm a scholar of the, uh, the British Empire and I use material culture as my key source. Um, as Emily mentioned, I used to work at the British Museum and as an education officer. So working with schools and young audiences um, as a main part of my job. So and throughout my work as an academic now, um, I've always tried to forefront the stories of objects. And I'll talk more about that in the presentation. Um, but recently, as many of you know, um, and we have spoken about this, um, I've been collaborating with Sasha Smith, who's I think spoken at Teacher Talk Radio before, um, and uh, it's been the most wonderful collaboration um, and our, it's constantly developing. So um, uh, hopefully I'll be sharing some new things with some of you and we're really grateful for the opportunity to share our, our work in this area. Um, we've been working with different audiences as well and that's really inspired and helping us build forward. So what I'll be talking about today is, first of all, I'll talk about rethinking empire through a material lens. Um, I'll then look a bit, and this then, then ties with what Owen was talking about, I'll talk about how I research objects to talk a little bit about how that can reveal the historical process and how I think this is a really powerful way to help students actually see how historians develop those interpretations. Um, and then I'll finally conclude with some of the uh, um, uh, factors that Sasha and I have identified as what makes objects so powerful in the classroom. Um, I'm sure that many of you are working in this way or absorbing this, but I think that we can still encourage more people to think in these creative ways, um, to use material culture as a source alongside text. Um, Empire is a great topic in which to do this for many reasons, which I'll hope to um, uncover today. And of course, and we're running, uh, we're developing resources um, that we're going to be sharing online very soon to support anyone who wants to start to do this object-based inquiry with backed up by scholarship. So, um, you know, and this is an introductory slide, which um, I, I, I've kind of encapsulated quite a lot of what I feel about objects in this slide. And I hope that it kind of speaks to what um, some of you understand about it. But I think it's important to remember why ob uh, objects for understanding empire. But throughout human history, empires were about power and possessions from commodities through to um, uh, monuments and celebrations. Empires were fundamentally material. Um, the British Empire was an empire of things and we can effectively explore it through things. Um, and I find that these are, and I want to underline how much they can offer us as sources for interrogating the imperial experience. Um, and this is a kind of strap line which I developed as part of a book proposal, but I feel it's just a really useful one for helping us see exactly how, why this is significant. And I hope that examining objects helps us to understand how empire was created, sustained, expanded, mediated and celebrated, as well as how empires fall apart, the resistance and rebellions that undermined the even the most apparently secure and stable empires. And um, if anything captures this um, uh, more than the story of Gandhi and the way he used caddy cloth, um, the creation of a material um, as a form of resistance, um, it actually was creating that cloth, which was part of that um, um, uh, um, 
nonviolent protest and how material culture became the symbol of bringing together people in that struggle for independence. And of course, this is part of the wider turn in history towards material things. And this is really, it's been going on in history for several decades, but it's really in the last kind of 15 years that imperial historians have really started take, to take this seriously, deploying objects as sources alongside text. Um, and this again speaks to some of the um, some of the silences that Owen was just talking about. But I think that through objects we can resuscitate some of the voices and experiences of the enslaved and the marginalised, though those communities who haven't left a written record, um, as well as offering new experiences on historical phenomena and events which normally have been examined through text. Um, and there's a great example of this in an article by, by Margot Finn, um, who st has studied uh, the, the East India Company through material uh, in a brilliant way. And there's an open access book you can explore with that. Um, but she has um, unlocked a whole episode, a diplomatic episode that had been understood in a particular way, very much a male dominated, high diplomacy kind of perspective. And she looked at the material things that are involved in diplomatic encounters in this period of the Maratha Wars in the early 19th century in India and offered a totally new vision of how we saw that event, uh, which brought in women, it brought in local women. Um, and suddenly we see this whole episode differently. So material culture can do that. It can bring those voices um, and bring those people into our historical narratives that have been, um, uh, that have previously been um, uh, dominated um, the way that we see history. Um, Objects shaped the colonial world in so many ways, and some of them are still with us today. Um, and uh, obviously, again, yes, some are in museums, but there are other silences, what wasn't collected. And that is something I address in my work, and particularly one of our inquiries about enslavement um, in the Indian Ocean addresses some of those silences in the material record as well. Um, but we also need to use those sources that we have, the material alongside the textual, to understand fully the colonial encounter and its legacies today. I think that we think it's really important to think of objects as more than illustrations. Um, and this is something which you know many, uh, many scholars, even who aren't scholars of material culture, might use objects to provide um, uh, a, a, an image alongside what they're saying without really treating that object as closely and as, a, as much of a source as they might with a text. Um, and this is um, an object which I think is particularly beguiling and fascinating. Um, it's a statue, a wooden statuette of Queen Victoria. Um, there are several examples in museums across the country. This one is in the British Museum. There is one in uh, in the Pitt Rivers. I used that on an earlier slide. Um, there's one currently on display in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, and these are fascinating um, objects um, uh, which represent Victoria carved by West African sculptors. Um, but and, and traditionally, there's been very little information about these objects in museum databases. Um, uh, colonial collectors who acquired these objects and brought them to British museums largely didn't record the names of sculptors, um, uh, the names of Africans who were making these items. Uh, Zachary Kingdon, who now works at the National Museum of Scotland, has done some wonderful work examining these objects and trying to fill in those silences. Um, he looked at several examples of these because there are two, he recognised there's actually two different styles. And then he investigated these in more depth. And in a fascinating article, he creates a really interesting argument that suggests that these objects could have been commissioned by Aku women, women, um, importantly here. Um, the Aku were a community who had been, were part of the emancipated community who were um, uh, uh, originally from uh, in the Nigeria region. They were then emancipated in the Atlantic. They were settled in Sierra Leone and then moved back to Nigeria. So there's a whole process of migration going, mobility going on there. But he argues that some of these women could potentially have been the commissioners of these sculptors. This community looked really, um, uh, looked quite favorably upon the, um, uh, the, upon the, the the British and of the monarchy. Uh, they saw them as someone who had um, you know, uh, emancipated them. So they were actually represented an element of loyalty within that region. So these objects take on a really rich story and they aren't simply just, here's an African sculptor, probably commissioned by a British officer to make a vision of Victoria, which is how they'd conventionally been read before. So there's a really, really, hopefully that's just an example of how something which could just be, you know, an illustration on a slide, yes, as an African voice, actually adding real texture and complexity to how we think about um, peoples within the empire. 
And of course, there is a huge variety of um, uh, objects to draw upon. And um, we are collecting and gathering materials and resources for all of these. These are just a, a selection I've put together for some teacher training that we're doing for the Historical Association. We're running a really successful and inspiring webinar series, well, very inspiring for us um, as, as leaders of it. Um, uh, and these are just some objects which we've kind of pieced together just for a quick activity of what are some of the ideas that themes that you can bring bring out using these objects. Um, and this is just a selection which shows you the rich variety of themes that you can address through objects. So we have objects here of plunder from uh, Tipu Sultan's palace at Seringapatam. Objects that speak like the teapot that speak to the way in which empire objects entered the domestic space in Victorian Britain. Um, objects associated with enslavement and resistance, um, an identification band from the Caribbean, um, which uh, was used when uh, in the enslaved were going off the plantation. Um, key important was that that, um, uh, that mobility actually sometimes enabled them to communicate with other communities. So yes, it is a real object of ownership of, uh, uh, and of, of restriction because it has the name of the plantation owner on it. But then actually it encourages a sense of that that individual then may have been able to communicate with others. That communication within with communities in the ens enslaved plantations was central to uh, modes of resistance. I won't go on through the others because I know I'm aware of time, but I hope you can see that even just through these few fragments, there are such rich stories and that there are layers and themes that go within each one that you can build together to make very powerful inquiries. And I think that's what my work with Sasha has been showing. I'm now just going to talk through a couple of objects which I think help to reveal the historical process that I use when I research objects. And I think this is quite transferable to a classroom setting if you're trying to demonstrate how, how do historians work, how do we create interpretations. Um, this is an example of a kiti cha enzi, which means a chair of power in the British Museum. Um, and this is a common type of chair or throne on the East African coast. Um, and so I've studied several of these as part of my work more widely. Um, but this one is particularly interesting because on it, it has a plaque. Now you can't see it, it's very small here on the screen, but it explains that this object was the chair of Sultan Fumo Bakari, who was the Sultan of Witu, which is a small state on the East African coast. Um, and then it lists the number of naval ships that were associated with the seizing and the subjugation of Witu in the late 19th century as part of the scramble for Africa. And it says there that Ed, um, Sir, Ed, uh, Sir E. R. Fremantle was a leader of that um, uh, of the, the force that went in to um, take over Witu. So I was fascinated by this object. It's an amazing example of this type. And so I wanted to follow up. Where do I go next? So I started with um, uh, Fremantle and I found that he had papers in the National Maritime Museum. So I then went to that archive and I dug around through his papers and he described the taking of Witu and he mentioned bringing a throne from it. So there I had that moment. He was actually involved in seizing that throne. Um, I looked at newspapers from the time to add in a context about how this moment, this episode was viewed. I also discovered this object was displayed at the Royal Naval Exhibition at Chelsea. So I looked in the catalogue and you can see there at the bottom that it's described the state chair of Fumo Bakari, Sultan of Witu. And then again, it lists many of the different ships involved. This was a naval exhibition. This was about celebrating the Navy in the late 19th century. Um, interestingly, as part of um, as other European nations were gaining in power, this was really important. The Navy was important to signify its um, its role. And then I looked at this object in comparison with other types of Viti Via Enzi, other types of this care, and considered how significant its association was with Sultan Fumo Bakari. Um, so it's been a really rich way of thinking through this object. And as I said, I started with the chair itself and that plaque, and that's all I had to start with. And it was from there that I had to build and think and ask, where do I go next? And I think that idea is something which I think, you know, and I use this approach with my students as well, giving them an object and a couple of clues, a couple of fragments of evidence, and then saying, how do we go about this research? And they find that really clear because then they can see they're actively doing that history. They're at, they ask to think, how do I research something? And another example of this um, is um, uh, an object which um, was in the British Museum. Again, another object associated with plunder, but many objects which in museums are. Um, this is a silver casket um, seized from the palace of um, Tipu Sultan at Seringapatam. Um, and again, relating back to Owen's point about museums as interpretation, when I um, first 
encountered this object, it was in the, a gallery of the Middle East and very much associated with the arts of the Middle East. Its reference to Tipu Sultan was very minimal. Um, and it's actually now um, in the, uh, it, it has been rehoused in the museum and it's now part of the South Asia Gallery and is located alongside other objects associated with Tipu Sultan. So the museum there is seeing that actually that is a really important part of its object biography. Um, but again, similarly, I only had very few, and um, I researched this with a colleague, Cam Sharp-Jones, um, we had very few pr um, fragments of evidence to work with. In fact, it was only two letters. I won't read them to you because um, they, um, they come out a bit funnily on this slide and um, in the interests of time. But what they do is these two letters detail certain elements in the casket's history um, and explain how it's passed between certain members of the family who seized it. Um, there are women and men owning this object, which says something really interesting about how empire connections superseded gender in this way. It also speaks about a, a, a newspaper, so I had to go and follow that up. And what I've done with my students, I've presented them with these letters and say, OK, you've got an object and you've got this. Where do you go next? And so they've come up with really interesting ideas about studying the type of object, studying in more detail, looking at other objects similarly, and then also picking out from these letters those clues as to how you can research. Um, and uh, and what I did um, and uh, what Cam and I did was we created a kind of biography of the casket as it went through different members of the family. We followed up all the references to try and find particularly uh, un unlock more and more stories of the object. Um, it mentioned a tiny um, uh, the illustration of um, uh, Tupu Sultan's uh, uh, name, his father's name, Hyder Ali, on the, on the object. We had to study it really closely. That image you can see in the bottom right is a very small funnel with a really tiny, tiny indication of Hyder Ali's name. And we talk about the different ways that that Hyder could be interpreted, that name. So there's a really rich kind of scene here of seeing how objects actually are very visual and uh, tangible, I think, ways of explaining the historical process. Objects inherently present a historical problem and therefore make great starting points for inquiry and uncovering history in that way. And I should say this um, uh, article, this this uh, the chapter I wrote about, uh, sorry, Cam and I wrote about Tipu Sultan's um, uh, casket was then picked up by a, um, a, a then PGC student and now um, qualified teacher, Gabrielle West. Um, she wrote a series of um, uh, lessons about it and um, which had that were published last year in T uh, Teaching History 191 on Material Worlds. And it was incredibly exciting to see our research, which was published in the East India Company at Home Book, an open access book, um, being translated transformed into um, a, an inquiry. So do look at that if you want ideas of how this can be applied. This particular object can be applied in the classroom. So finally, I'm just going to talk through um, uh, some example, some of the ways in which we have done this and how Sasha Smith and I have been working. And it's important to underline that there are many different ways to use objects. You can use them as a starter, just get some conversation going. They are really powerful for accessing many students. What we find at university level as well as school level, um, that these that students who sometimes are a little bit scared of text or don't feel as confident will very happily talk about an object. There's something really accessible and democratic about that space, that about them, which many people feel they can offer something to say. Then we look at them as object as sources, but then what our work is really focusing on is object-centered lessons, object-led inquiries. Those require well-researched objects, but that's what we're trying to address. We're trying to make sure that teachers can access both lesson ideas, but also that scholarship behind it, so that there's a really rich variety of things to work on. Um, so the way this originated, um, this Objects of Empire project, um, was driven by Sasha. She heard me speak at the... Um, uh, she heard me speak at the Be Bold History talk um, and Sasha contacted me um, uh, about bringing objects into the curriculum. So this wasn't a case of an academic getting some funding and saying, can you bring this into your curriculum? Um, yeah, this has all been teacher led. And we transformed my level three module into her year eight unit. How do material objects help us understand Britain's role in the world? And it's a really great inquiry because it actually puts the skills of material analysis at its heart. It isn't saying this is the empire through objects. This is saying what do objects tell us about empire? And the, we go through many themes. They address really complex issues. Um, uh, each week they do a new object um, and with, uh, many, many themes are explored, but also they are manageable. It doesn't seem so overwhelming to think about the, the vastness of empire through a single object. 
Um, and then the assessment is an exhibition with labels that they have to, um, uh, and they are, are, uh, create themselves. So really thinking about what Owen was saying about interpretation. They are asked to curate, they are asked to design their own exhibition. Um, you know, it, it, we can, we'll obviously you can share, we'll, on our website we'll be sharing the ideas behind this, but it does encourage them then to think, actually museums are selective. Museums are constantly selecting the story they, they create. So it's building that idea of yes, the museum is a source as well. And it's so exciting to hear it, it, Owen doing that in a different setting. Um, also, the assessment was the third most popular element of it. Actually, the assessment inspired them. Um, so, and this is something we're kind of thinking more about how can we develop rigorous assessment that could be transferred across different levels, even GCSE and uh, A-level, that could actually maintain these creative and inspiring ways of teaching um, throughout school. So finally, we'll just be talking about the power of objects in the classroom. Why is this worth it? Um, and this is very much drawing on Sasha's uh, like, like work um, on, on what she said as a, as a teacher, and I've kind of interpreted this through as a scholar. But the teacher feedback has been tremendous. It feels like proper history. I was excited to teach it. It links to academia and scholarship. And this is what lots of people want to do. They want to know they're drawing on that scholarship. And so it reflects, this approach absolutely reflects what's going on in academic history and the way we are teaching and assessing in um, higher education. Um, broadening, um, uh, broadening historical skills, uh, we access in complex history. In a limited time, a single object opens up numerous questions and nuances. And I've talked about how accessible they are to a range of students. Um, challenging histories are very on, uh, are very clearly um, accessed through this. Teachers feel quite, uh, have more confidence in using, addressing complex histories of empire when you're starting with the object. It gives us a way, we're exploring the history of the object rather than we're addressing controversial big histories of empire. It seems to be very powerful giving teachers more confidence in that. They offer uh, opportunities for inquiry-based learning. Storytelling can be really well done through objects. If uh, you know, started with an object story, it really helps unfold some really complex episodes in history. And they can be very flexible depending on the aims and context. You can really do a lot with them. And finally, Sasha's word there, objects are brilliant. They are engaging, complex, and invite curiosity, not just for the students. Clearly, teachers enjoy this too. A lot of them have said to us, this is why I did it. This is, I feel like I'm getting back to what inspired me about history in the first place. So I'm finishing off there. Um, uh, managed to keep to time, I think. Uh, so um, I'll uh, thank you very much, Emily, for the opportunity. Um, and it, uh, I really appreciate you all listening today. Thank you so much as well, Sarah. We really appreciate your time and your timekeeping. So thank you. Um, some fantastic things there. And I like the connections you're already making with some of our previous speakers. It's that idea of Owen's interpretations in a museum. Kerry was talking about those authentic outcomes earlier on, and you're talking about the students creating their own interpretations and that curation of them through those different inquiries. So th thank you so much. So much to take away from today. Um, we are going to move on to our final two speakers. So we have got Derek Roberts who's going to be talking for us about concept cartoons. And then we are going to go straight in to um, speaking. Karma Graph is going to talk to us about task design in primary history. So thank you very much, Derek, for your time as well. And I will hand straight over to you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks uh, for having me on. I feel a bit of a, a fraud having listened to all these fantastic talks and all this stuff. And I've got loads of notes and things that I'll be taking away. Um, I'm going to start. Just That's rubbish, Derek. You're great. I just thought I'd nip in to say that. You, you, <laughs> you're a great sharer. You do great things on, on everywhere, really. So please don't say that and get on with it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. I, I thought I'd start just a little bit of, of my journey. Because I've been a teacher, I say 20 plus years. I think it's near enough 25 years now um i'm old enough to have been one of those teachers that qualified with qts having not having to go through the probation year and i spent my first half of my career in and around london um working in london borough of bexley and then in kent towards the end um and it was mainly pastoral jobs but in 2011 2012 the school i was working at went into special measures um, and as many of the, the listeners no doubt will know that meant becoming an academy Things got difficult and in 2013, I moved up to Scotland and I teach now in a school in Fort William, Lock Arbor High School. I can see Ben Nevis from my classroom window, which is quite the distraction. Um, and since then, I went through a difficult time with various issues with job promotions and various stuff. But I was appointed to what we call principal teacher of learning and teaching in 2023. 
Um, and I've really been trying to to em embrace this sort of thing and improve how I get on in my teaching. Um, and you know, I was I was that teacher who for years would say, "Well, I don't have that problem," and so on. But I really took an active role. I was I was um, active in trying to to improve my teaching. And as part of my role, I got the chance to do a lot more research and a lot more um, sort of diving deep into it. And I want to talk today about the concept cartoon. So I'll get on to, to what's on there. The concept cartoon began as a way of addressing misconceptions in science classes, uh, developed in the 1990s by Brenda Keogh, um and Stuart Naylor. I came across the theory behind them mostly when I was reading Bruce Robertson's book, Power Up Your Pedagogy. Uh, and the quote you can see there on, on the screen, you know, they're designed to shine a spotlight on common misconceptions where students consider what different characters are in a cartoon, uh, different characters in a cartoon are saying, indicating whether they agree with them or not. And, and I know one of our earlier speakers was talking about how she likes to bring up a couple of stick figures to, to stimulate debate. And that is fundamentally what it is. Um, the first time I ever saw a concept cartoon, uh, a colleague who teaches science, um, he's a chemistry teacher, but he was teaching a, a BGE, so that's S1, S2, so for those of you teaching English, that's year eight and nine. Um, he was teaching a physics lesson on on um, light. And I'm watching from the back, and up came this, this cartoon. I don't know if you can see it particularly well, but there it is. There's a student there, they've got a lamp and a shadow, and there's three or four different perspectives on what's going on. And I'd never come across this, this idea, and I'm sure many people have, but the discussion which followed was absolutely fascinating it was a great way for the teacher to come in and to say look what do you think about this and to stimulate um a really good uh discussion so i thought well can i take this into into the history classroom and at this time i was having a big drive in my department towards um more pre-teaching i'd read the book uh several books about cognitive load theory and i wanted to lower the cognitive load i wanted to remove some of the the harder text and harder keywords and harder um things from whatever new topic i was going to be teaching so i brought in um pre-teaching units so at the start of each unit now we'll have two or three lessons worth of work where i'll introduce the 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 core basic knowledge that they need to access this new stuff and a review of previous years had highlighted a number of common misconceptions, things that came, kept coming up in assessments, mistakes that that students made in their understanding or things that they'd seen um, a couple of years ago. It was things that they'd seen in films or seen on Twitter or whatever. But now it's constantly, I'm well, I saw this on TikTok. Um, so I began adding sections where I addressed misconceptions and I tried to identify places where I could do this. So my typical pre-teaching unit now will be, here's the key vocab, here's the key um, personnel, here's the key dates, and then we'll look at, at the preconceptions, the misconceptions, sorry. And I thought the best way to, to get that across is just to show you a couple. I'm actually going to have to skip on a little bit because I've got the slides in the wrong order and I apologize for that. So here we have two of my concept cartoons. We were studying witchcraft. This is an S2 topic, so that's year nine uh, and we were studying witchcraft and i started with these three statements that had come up a lot in the previous year's work so for example a lot of my students would have said only women were accused of witchcraft or and then a lot of them would have said that witches were burned at the stake and there was this the idea that if you were accused of being a witch you were automatically found guilty so how this would work in the classroom is that at the start in the pre-teaching unit, I gave them this on the board and we had a look and we, we get the mini whiteboards out and we discuss, have you heard of these things? And do you believe in these things? And that was where, if you look, it's, this is what they would do. So they would highlight the ones that they'd heard and, and so on. And then going back, they were told that at the end of the unit, we revisit the misconceptions. We haven't quite finished this unit yet. So I don't have, uh, a finished one that a student has done to show you on here. Um, but 
what was interesting that when I came back to finish the unit, all of the students had picked up on these misconceptions. As we'd gone through the teaching, they'd picked up on these ideas and they, um, on their own, without any prompting from me, they were then able to fill this in with evidence that suggests that this is a misconception. So, for example, they were looking at the first one of only women were accused of witchcraft. They were all coming up with the fact that, well, no, when we looked at the Pendle witches, you have men who were accused and with the witches being burned it was like no because the ones in salem were hanged the ones in pendle were hanged and so on and i've sort of found that they're they're really good and i've been trying to build them into into other areas as well um my s ones were doing one um one on vikings and so on and they're really useful ideas to sort of hang misconceptions on and then they stimulate a great deal of of debate so they're now they're becoming quite common in my practice and the students are quite used to this idea and it goes back i think to um what christine was saying earlier christine council was saying earlier about bringing in the narrative and trying not to you know teach it in a rigid way i'd sort of become scared of um any sort of deviation uh, and any interesting way I've found of, of stimulating debate in the classroom, it's worth losing five, 10, 15 minutes of a lesson just to, to be able to do that. Initially, I'd thought of them as being just for uh, what we call up here, the BG, the, so the S1, S2 and S3, so years eight, nine and 10 up here. But I have also started bringing them up in towards my examination classes into my national five and higher classes. And you can see the one on the bottom right of the screen here this was used in a lesson on nazi germany trying to introduce the the intentionalist versus functionalist debate and looking at the those historians who have that sort of thing um and you know it works it works really well um and i realize i'm coming up close to my time so i'll i'll skip on the thing about them is they're they shouldn't take long to do they take me about 10 minutes to come up with um, and the idea is to provide three or four alternative statements for discussion, match the statement though to the level of the children's hoffs. I wouldn't bring their intentionist, functionist one to, to first years. They shouldn't take more than 10 minutes to make. They're a very small part of my teaching, but they are worth using. As it says at the bottom, they're a low effort, but high impact idea. Great for stimulating debate among examination classes, very effective at helping students to identify um, the misconceptions. and. That's pretty much all I can say about those. I'm sorry if it's not the slickest of, of presentations, but they are really, like I said, they're super good. They're very easy to, to make, and they've had a big impact on the teaching that I've had. And I'm thankfully able to see now that as we're coming towards assessment time at the end of units, that the scores are going up because there are less misconceptions in and around what the students are producing. There is so much work about misconceptions around at the moment. And I think this is such a fantastic way to address them in a really in a way that really allows the students to get behind it. Um, I love the concept of like, but now I know to really. And I think that really shows people, shows the students what they've learned. So I think there's absolutely something that we can take away. And I'm what I am really loving about today, and particularly from yours, Derek, was the, the practical strategies. And that's something that comes across all the time, Derek, in your in your teaching and learning work and in your history work on Twitter, I am eternally grateful for the things that you share and I'm sure the rest of the community is as well. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. So we are going to go to a presentation from Karl McGrath, who is going to talk about task design in primary history today. He has um, drawing from his experiences as both a primary teacher and a curriculum task design lead, and you can find more of his work on his Facebook site. Um, he is going to delve into the, the intricacies of planning primary history lessons with a focus on effective task design. So some of these will definitely come back to what we've seen of Emily. We are aiming to finish just after one o'clock. So this is our, our last main speaker and then we will bring the event to a close. Again, please be really present on socials. Please tweet out everything that you have enjoyed today, the key things that you have found, and you know, follow our different speakers to find out more about their work. So over to Carl. Hello. My name is Mr. M, ICT, or Carl McGrath. Uh, 
and um, this is my session on primary history. Hello, my name is Mr. M. I C T or Carl McGrath, and um, this is my session on primary history task design. So, just a little introduction. Um, my name's Carl McGrath. Um, I'm a teacher at Newcastle. I'm also the curriculum task design lead. Um, I'm currently year sixteen teacher and um, my role kind of affords me a level of responsibility across the curriculum working in conjunction with the curriculum lead and the curriculum team and um, my specific role is looking at how the curriculum is implemented within the classroom so that development from curriculum idea and plan uh, down to tasks and pedagogy. So just a brief, brief context. So I think we are having some technical difficulties there. Yeah, that was my fault. Um, well, not my fault, but yeah, videos. Um, yeah. We can, can always post it out afterwards that everybody we will. what we'll do is we will upload that video in a minute to the teachers talk events youtube channel so if you're on youtube just go to teachers talk radio events find the channel we will post that video and then we'll also tweet it out onto the ttr history account and also on facebook we'll post it there as well on the teachers talk history um channel on facebook Carl very kindly stepped in for us after a bit of a last minute reshuffle um, and wasn't able to be here. So he recorded his talk for us. So that does give us the ability to put that out. But um, huge thank you to Carl McGrath for doing that for us because it was very last minute and he has done a fantastic job. So please go, do go and watch that on our on our socials and on that YouTube link. Just a few bits from me. Obviously, a huge, massive congratulations and thanks to to Emily, Claire and Tina, who um have organized this whole event that you've experienced today um which has been uh, phenomenal and um, fantastic huge amount of work goes on uh, behind the scenes with these uh, not only in terms of the logistics but also just thinking about how to put them together so huge congratulations and thanks to the team for, for doing it the recording for this i know many people have asked if you signed up for this as a uh, on the website on the teachers talk radio website ttr uh, ttradio.org forward slash events if you go to that web address and you click on the history event and the link that's there it will give you access to the recording for free so if you go to uh, ttradio.org forward slash events um, and you'll see the history event there you can just click on that and it will it will sign you up into the recording for this event. Um, obviously, wherever you've joined from, whatever part of the world you've joined from, uh, welcome and thank you um, for joining us. It's been fantastic. And obviously, we have lots of other subject events coming up. We have science on the twentieth of April. Uh, we have upcoming events in maths online. We have upcoming events in primary. Uh, we have upcoming events in, what else have we got? Goodness me, MFL. Uh, yeah, we've got all sorts of subjects there. And any time that we confirm an event, we put it on the website there at ttradio.org forward slash events on the events tab at the top. So you can see any upcoming event we have and sign up for it. All our events are free for classroom teachers. So if you are a teacher, you can access the face-to-face -face events for free. Anyone can access our online events for nothing. Um, obviously, we really appreciate our sponsors like today. We have Time Travel Education who have supported this event today. Um, but we have lots of sponsors and supporters for our events who, who help us to put these on. Uh, so big shout out to them. So I'm going to hand over to Emily. I don't know whether you've got anything to say, Emily, just to finish off. 
Um, we just want to say, if you've been inspired by anything that you've heard today and think that you could also do a really good job, then we are looking for speakers for our events later in the year and even into next year. So if you think, if you've been inspired, if you've got a lesson, an inquiry, just something cool that you would like to come and talk to about, then please do get in touch with us on our socials. We would love to hear from you. Just want to say thank you to all of you for coming. And um, thanks again to our sponsors, Time Travel Education, and thanks for Tom for running all of the behind the scenes stuff for us. Um, um, as well as all our amazing speakers today. We've got Emily Fuller and Show, Kerry Summers, Derek Roberts, Owen Williams, Matt Bancroft, Sarah Longair, and uh, Kerry Summers, and finally Carl, who wasn't able to be with us today. But and Christine Council. And Christine, of course, as well. The, the highlight, I think, of some from the day, given our Twitter. So thank you very much, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.